You're watching Jack's PBS More, WJCT Jacksonville. Right. I did. 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 I Joyce, how are you? I probably want to take it up. Yeah. You want to take it up. School Board of Duval County School District is now convening its regular monthly meeting. To everyone present and to our television viewers, I wish to extend a warm welcome to this meeting of the Duval County School Board. The vision statement of Duval County School Board states, every student is inspired and prepared for success in college or career and life. The mission of the Duval County School Board is to provide educational excellence in every school, in every classroom, for every student, every day. The Duval County School Board is here tonight to listen to reports from district staff and to set policy for the district that will improve student achievement. We also will address a budgets, contracts, personnel appointments, and other business items that require a vote of the board. The management and day-to-day -day operations of the district are the responsibility of the superintendent. It is not the role of the board to make managerial or operational decisions. The board has policies and procedures in place to assist the superintendent in resolving management and operational issues. If items appear to move quickly, it is because the board meets in an agenda committee meeting prior to the board meeting for an in-depth review of all agenda items. The committee meeting for the April 5th, 2022 school board meeting will be held on March 22nd, 2022 at 9 a.m. and the public is invited to attend. As a show of courtesy and respect to each other, we ask that all mobile phones be turned off and that no flash photography be used during the meeting. For those wishing to address the board during our public comments portion of the board meeting, please note that we will accept speaker cards until 6.20 p.m. The CDC currently recommends indoor mask wearing where the COVID-19 COVID community level is designated as high. According to the CDC's website, Duval County's level is currently designated as high. Thank you for taking the time to join us this evening and for your interest in the operation of the Duval County School District. I invite us all to please stand for um, a moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you so much. At this time, we will have our school presentations from District 6, Mamie Agnes Jones Elementary School. And if we can give a rousing round of applause <laughs> as Principal Lee comes forward. How are you, Principal Lee? I am fantastic. Thank Excellent. you so much. Thank Excellent. you for having me here today. Thank you, Chairman Willie, Honorable Vice Chair Coker Daniels and members of the school, Duval County School Board, Superintendent Dr. Green, and guests. My name is Marianne Lee, and I'm the very proud principal of Mamie Agnes Jones Elementary. And we have a short video clip to show you. I think the school is the connection with the community. I've taught students, and then I've taught their children, and I've even taught grandchildren. <laughs> So I see them coming back to the community because I think it is the small town feel where they know that they're cared about and taken care of. I have students that come from larger schools all the time that come out here and their parents have fallen in love with the fact that there are smaller classes, that the teachers' teams are smaller, 
that they get to build those relationships with their children and um, growing them socially and emotionally is really important. We have a top-notch school because they care. I think just that hometown feel, small town environment, and they care about the school. We just always hone in on building a relationship. We try to call every kid by their first name so they know, hey, we value you. We are invested in your future, not just now, but beyond our school. Bottom line, the academics is very important. We have had many, many years of success academically here. Our test scores show that. Our teachers here see the needs of our students. If they're struggling, they're really pushing in to say, how can I reach that child? If they have kind of exceeded what that basic curriculum is, they're really pushing to say, how can I enrich this child? They're really positive and encouraging, and they don't get mad when you're having a hard time. They're very patient with you. So when you're like small classes, they they can teach you things that children need help on. They do help me a lot. I think it's very amazing here. I do feel like Mamie Agnes Jones does a great job of making the school owned by the students. If you were to visit the classrooms, you'll see that there are just these little pieces where the students themselves are owning their classroom and their learning here, which is important. We're trying to foster that leadership to let them know what it takes to be a good leader, what are strong leadership skills. It's our job to see the leader in them, cultivate that, and then bring that out. And so therefore, they bring it out, then they bring it out in their peers. And ultimately, isn't that what great leaders do? It really does feel like Baldwin helps to own the children and raise the children in this town. Teachers, the residents, even the older people that had kids years ago, like myself, we care. Anytime they need something, we jump in and try to help them. We do have a strong parent support here. They buy into it because they feel like they're a partner. They're part of it. It's not just my child goes to this school, it's our school. We're just a huge family. It's everybody knows everybody, so. And we support everyone and we love everyone, so. It's, it's just great. Every day I come to work and I come through the town, it's just a great feeling that I have that this is where I want to be. This is where I would bring my own children. I think why people should consider Mamie Agnes Jones is because of the small town values that we have. I feel like your child is not going to be lost in the shuffle here. I feel like your child is going to be loved in whatever classroom that they're in. Thank you. And if I can point out a few small things about my school that I absolutely adore and treasure, and thank you for this opportunity. Recently, this past school year, in the midst of COVID, we increased our school grade, which we were three percentage points away from an A. We went from a C to three percentage points from an A. In addition to the increase in student achievement, Mamie Agnes Jones was in the top 1% in the state for its cohort growth index of 19 points. And this achievement made our school number three in Duval County for mathematics, according to our athletics friends. We have revised our school vision statement and rebranded through the help of our district communications office. We initiated our National Elementary Honor Society and we built that as a start to honor our students but then move to community projects for our, our, fa our families. This year we created a STEM lab to help feed, our, get our students ready to feed into Baldwin, which has that fabulous robotics program there at the Baldwin Middle High School. We've increased our technology access thanks to uh, Mr. Colbert and his team, and um, that also includes interactive flat panel boards to make learning more powerful for kids because we know we've reached them in various different ways now. So increasing engagement um, has been huge. Speaking of engagement, our JPEV um, School Leadership Initiative has allowed us to actually take teachers away from Duval County and actually give them um, empowerment through um, engagement strategies as well. We score, um, we increased in four out of five areas in our, our five essentials culture index last school year. And we've actually built our TriCaster and our MHA running club because our boys were upset because our girls on the run were having too much fun. <laughs> so our boys got very upset. So we had to uh, change our name to not girls on the run, but to include our boys as well. And it's amazing when you have kids that uh, may not 
maybe on the borderline, maybe one of our bubble students, but when you give them something to motivate them to be at mm -hmm. school every single day, how much they can, how much it helps them to stay in school. Um, we've also been designated as a ramp school by the National School Counseling Association and have had our school counselor, Ms. Grace Wilhelm, be recognized as Florida School Counselor of the Year for 2021. Um, this year we are on track to submit for our PBS model school, which has been a goal of mine for a while, and I know we're going to achieve that as well. And due to the work of our school district, we have a new playground for our students and have revamped our cafeteria to make it, make it a more positive, bright, learning, uh, enjoyable eating environment for our students. And then finally, we have our our campus beautification day every year. I feel like that's so important because we want our kids not only to come to school but to treasure their school and it also teaches great responsibility for them as well. So I'm very honored to talk about my school as you can tell and I thank uh, board member Joyce for allowing us to do so today and thank you Chairman Willie for giving me the opportunity. Excellent and stay right there. First of all can we give uh, Principal Lee a huge round of applause for all of your work. And, and I would be remiss if I did not allow Board Member Joyce, she's beaming over here, uh, <laughs> to say a few comments and words. Board Member Joyce? Thank you. Well, I will say Miss Lee is a very wonderful, nurturing, loving principal. And it's evident as soon as I walked in the building the first time that I visited. Um, I was really impressed with the community involvement. Um, the churches and the um, all the organizations out there really support Baldwin Elementary and Baldwin Middle Senior. The thing that really is so unique to me, though, is that every year the football players come and they read to the students. So you have students from the high school going to the elementary school and mentoring and working with those kids. So they build that relationship. They do a, a homecoming parade that uh, Dr. Green and I have been able to participate in in the past right down the middle of US 1 and the mm -hmm. elementary school and the middle and high school participate in that. But the thing that really is the, the icing on the cake to me is at the end of the year the seniors from the high school go to the elementary school and all the students sit outside line the hall and watch the seniors walk through the school and some of those seniors went to kindergarten at that school and so it's just that's the special vibe that's the hometown feeling and i think it's special and i wanted to um thank you miss uh lee for coming and sharing that with the board and the community thank you so much thank you and, and thank you so much for all the work and there you you could have talked for hours, I bet. Um, but we really appreciate all your work and your service to our students. So thank you so much, Principal Lee. One more thank round of applause as Principal Lee has to a seat. We're going to move on to the communications portion of our agenda for today. And we're going to start with a, a very special uh, recognition and resolution, actually. And it's for the Douglas and Anderson Centennial. We have some, some folks who are sitting in our first few rows. I see they're all matching and looking good out there. Um, and we just want to make sure we pause. There's so much rich history in this in this city. Uh, we talked about it last uh, last month when I did my board chair report, just about the rich history. And some of our history is sitting right here in our front rows today, and has gone through the walls of a school we're about to recognize. So I want to pass um, the mic over to uh, board member Pearson, who's going to talk about this special uh, opportunity for us to recognize and read a resolution for us. Great, thank you. So for a hundred years, Douglas Anderson School, in its many forms, and you'll hear in the resolution that it's had many forms, has been a blessing and a treasure in the center of Jacksonville. The resolution will outline the history and achievements of the school, but I wanted to make a few notes about the school's namesake. Douglas Anderson and Walter Thorpe were the driving force behind the establishment of a school for the black community on the south side. and in the time that the school was founded, the south side was Jack's Beach to Mandarin, um, and that encompassed a very large area. Mr. Anderson began the first free school bus transportation service at the school, and he also was the school's first president of the PTA. Uh, Mr. Anderson's story highlights the importance of what a local champion looks like for our neighborhood schools, and um, the importance and the legacy that that can leave 
in a community. As we celebrate 100 years of DA's continued presence, I think it's appropriate to share a stanza from the school's alma mater. Alma mater. Um, this was written by Miss Sadie Veronica Fields Jeffers. Dear God, protect dear DA. Dear God, protect her great works that help us improve our knowledge and striving for higher goals. May our eyes forever see the right and never the wrong. May we grow strong and faithful to DA where we belong. Mm. So now I'm going to read the resolution, and after that I will call up um, the representatives who are here to receive the resolution, and we will take a photograph together. Duval County Public School Board Resolution. Whereas Douglas Anderson School of the Arts opened in 1922 as South Jacksonville School Number 107, and whereas School Number 107 was the only school in Jacksonville Southside for African American students in grades 1 through 9, and whereas the school board in 19, 1945 renamed the school for Douglas Anderson, an African American community leader instrumental in the school's founding. And whereas the school became Douglas Anderson High School in 1955 and swiftly became an educational and cultural center for African American students throughout southeastern Duval County. And whereas Douglas Anderson High School closed in 1968 as a result of school desegregation and later served as one of the original campuses of the new Florida Junior College. And whereas the school reopened in 1985 as the Douglas Anderson School of the Arts. And whereas Douglas Anderson School of the Arts is continually recognized nationally across the full spectrum of visual and performing arts, including such recent distinctions as National Exemplary Arts School of Distinction and a National Grammy Signature School. And whereas Douglas Anderson School of the Arts continues to build on a foundational tradition of academic excellence, with 98% of recent graduates attending college, universities, and conservatories, the graduating class amassing $26 million in scholarships, and the school being consistently ranked as one of the best high schools in the state and the nation. And whereas Douglas Anderson School of the Arts students are every year showered with honors honors and accolades in local, state, and national assessments and competitions in band, cinematic arts, creative writing, dance, guitar, orchestra, piano, theater, visual arts, and vocal music, and whereas founders and alumni of Douglas Anderson from its original inception to the present day have made innumerable and immeasurable contributions to the Jacksonville community in all aspects of civic leadership. And whereas people across the United States and around the world have been immensely enriched by the talent and artistic contributions of Douglas Anderson School of the Arts alumni, and whereas even as youth, the highly gifted students of Douglas Anderson School of the Arts, under the guidance and direction of an outstanding group of artistic educators, are themselves an important and treasured element of Jacksonville's increasingly vibrant arts community. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Duval County Public School Board does hereby recognize and celebrate the centennial anniversary of the founding of school number 107, which later became named for Douglas Anderson and has emerged as one of the nation's best schools for academics and the arts, and that the board further honors all who have emerged from the school's rich history to share their leadership and creative brilliance with the world and that the board esteems the outstanding groups of educators serving a broad diversity of youth who have defined and redefined the meaning of excellence in arts and academics for a hundred years. Resolved this day, March 1st, 2022, by the Duval County Public School Board. So we have with us tonight um, the Centennial Celebration Planning Committee. Leonard Baker is the chairperson, Constance McCrary House is the co-chairperson, Gary Merritt is the president of the DA number 107 Alumni Association, Flora Coleman is the executive administrator, and Rachel Gunter is the chairperson of the Douglas Anderson School of the Arts Alumni. We also have with us Principal Tina Wilson. So if y'all would come forward, I have several things to give you. <laughs> and we'll take a picture. We can give them a round of applause as they come forward. Dr. Green, 
invite the other people up to. There, I want to invite all of them up to take a picture. Can can I have a point of privilege? Can if can we get the full if if you're able to can we get the full group up to the front? There's too much history in this room to yeah. not capture this picture. While they're coming up, I just want to add that the uh, Florida Times Union did a very good article on the history of Douglas Anderson, and I found out that Mrs. Uh, Lawson was the dean of girls when I was in high school, didn't know she was related to uh, the granddaughter of uh, Douglas Anderson. Wow. So a lot of history wow. there. So thank you. I know they're going to be celebrating in a gala this Friday that I've already tr picked out my outfit for, uh, so I'm ready, ready, ready to go. And I'm sure if, if it's this group, there's going to be some good food and good music and a great celebration. So looking forward to that. So congratulations again on the centennial. And now we're going to have Brianna uh, Nelson Canty come forward and uh, finish us out with our communications recognitions. Only a select group of talented students from around the world get the experience to participate in the Carnegie Hall Honors Performance Series. Participation in this event allows students to build newfound confidence, strengthen musical abilities, and create big ideas for their future. Duval County had two gifted students receive the opportunity to take part in this once-in-a-lifetime experience. Tonight, we will recognize them. These students will also be receiving a superintendent coin of excellence. Our first recognition goes to vocalist, Miss Jessie Ellen DeHardy. Miss Jessie Ellen DeHardy is a student at Douglas Anderson School of the Arts. Miss DeHardy was selected for her prestigious, for the highly prestigious International 2022 High School Honors Performance Series to perform in the choir. Having studied music for over six years, Mr. Hardy had the opportunity to perform as an alto with the Honors Treble Choir in New York City. She joined performers from 47 U.S. states and from around the world for a special performance at the world famous Carnegie Hall. Please join us in congratulating Ms. Jessie Ellen DeHardy on her performance at Carnegie Hall. Next, we recognize violinist William Bell. Mr. William Bell, a student at Riverside High School, is an accomplished violinist. He is a member of the Cathedral Art Project String Orchestra and served as a mentor for a beginning violin class at Central Riverside Elementary School. Mr. Bell's second prize award at the Crescendo International Music Competition gained him an invitation to perform at Carnegie Hall in New York City. Please help us congratulate Mr. William Bell on his performance at Carnegie Hall.
The Florida Department of Education asked each of Florida school districts to select their top 11th grade students in the areas of science, technology, engineering, or mathematics, otherwise known as STEM. The student, the Sunshine State Scholar Program, sponsored by the Florida Lottery, allows each scholar the opportunity to travel to an extraordinary two-day program designed to connect students with employers that specialize in STEM fields. Tonight, we recognize three remarkable students who were selected as Sunshine State Scholars for Duval County. These students will also be receiving a Superintendent Coin of Excellence. Our first Sunshine State Scholar is Ms. Charlotte Cockham. Ms. Charlotte Cockham is an international bachelorette student at Samuel Wolfson School for Advanced Studies. Ms. Cockham is an active member of her school and her community. She is the junior class president and the founder and president of the Active Minds Civic Engagement Club, which promotes the research and discussion of current events between students at Wilson. In the future, Ms. Cockham would like to become a physician, using her knowledge and skills to impact her community and make a positive change. Please join us in congratulating Sunshine State Scholar Ms. Charlotte Cockham. Ms. Dorothy Kakabani is our next Sunshine State Scholar. Ms. Dorothy Kakabani is a senior at Sandalwood High School in the early college program. No stranger to being a servant leader, Ms. Kakabani serves as a junior achievement instructor, volunteer online tutor, National Honor Society Secretary, District Honor Choir Scholar, Youth Leadership Mentor, and Bowling Team Captain. Ms. Kakabani plans to study biochemistry or double major in agri-science and nutrition in the future. Please join us in congratulating Sunshine State Scholar, Ms. Dorothy Kakabani. Last but not least, we recognize Ms. Nyla Searle, our final Sunshine State Scholar. Ms. Nyla Searle is a student at Stanton College Preparatory School, where she is in the International Bachelorette Program. Ms. Searle is an active member of her school community, where she is a member of the Spanish Honor Society, Senior Honor Society, Math Honor Society, Mu Alpha Theta, B Black Student Union, Visits Club, and a host of other clubs and organizations. Having a love for STEM, she plans to go into biomedical engineering. Please join us in congratulating Sunshine State Scholar, Ms. Nyla Searle. <laughs> this concludes tonight's recognitions. Thank you so much, Ms. Nelson Canty. Can we have one more round of applause for these amazing students who are in here? Excellent. Now we'll move on to the approval of the March 1st, 2022 agenda. That the Duval County School Board approved the March 1st, 2022 agenda as submitted on February 22nd, 2022 with the following changes. Information technology. Managed Internal Broadband Services, item amended. IT Hardware, RFP, MTech Inc., item amended. Um, ask for a motion. So move. We'll second. Move. Moved by Board Member Jones, second by Board Member Hershey. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, call for your vote.
by your action, you have approved this item 7-0. Thank you. Now we'll move on to the chairman's report. And I just have a few slides for us today, but before I, I even jump into the slides, I just want to just recognize the moment in time we're in in the world. Um, we, we just have a lot going on in the world, and I want to point out specifically our, our, our students are witnessing the same thing we are, we're feeling the same thing we are when we think about the, the happenings that are going on in Ukraine right now. And I can guarantee you we have folks who are connected directly or indirectly with that country. So I just wanted to make sure that we made mention of that. And of course, we just pray for peace and, and that we can move through this uh, with, with the, with quickly as we move. So just wanted to start there. Also just wanted to, uh, it's unfortunate that the last couple of months, uh, last month and this month, I've had to come up to the dais and actually have a slide where we're remembering one of our legends in our community. Um, we want to just take a moment uh, to remember Coach James Day, um, a true rock uh, in this community, someone who, when I first moved here, I, he was one of the first people I met as well. It, you can read his some of the bullets that we have here, but one of the things he's most well known for, even even literally, I just came from my desk and I have an invite to the Bob Hayes um, tournament and golf tournament and all these other pieces. He founded that Invitational Track Meet, which is known around the world. Um, and it is just amazing that we had somebody in our community who, who could lift that up. Oh, he was also the Reigns track and field coach. Um, he led the Vikings to a state runner-up finishes in 73 and 74, and then state championships in 76 and 89. Uh, he retired back in 1997 and was inducted into the National High School Coaches Association Hall of Fame in 2015. He has definitely left his mark um, on this community and in state and in the world. And we just want to uh, take a moment, just recognize Coach James Day at this moment. So thanks for all. We just thank him for all he did for this community. Thank you. And we will be doing a, a formal resolution to make sure that we commemorate his life and his legacy that he, le he left on this district. So we are in the district, we're all about making sure that we're recruiting uh, amazing educators to come into our, our schools. And one of the things that um, is going on right now is a, a, a campaign called Thousand by 2025. And up under that campaign, we have an initiative called The Ones. And The Ones is an initiative for, for black men, and it's a black male collective. Uh, we understand that only 6% of the teachers that are in Duval County are black male educators, and we want to see that increased. We want to see recruitment overall increase, but specifically that group. So just this past week, um, the ones kicked off its inaugural sort of meeting. Um, we had it at the Jaguar Stadium. They were gracious enough to host and, and provide that space. We partnered with the Jacksonville Public Education Fund, and we had over 150 or so black male educators from this district get together, um, number one, to see each other, to connect, but two, to talk about um, barriers uh, that they had and also opportunities to get through those barriers. And this group is going to be all about connecting, retaining, and developing um, this group uh, to really to create an opportunity for our students to be successful. Because we truly believe if our students see folks that look like them, they have a better opportunity and have an increased opportunity for success. Excited about this initiative. I want to just shout out a couple of people. Uh, number one, Sekou Smith, who works in our HR department, did an amazing job on the back end operational pieces of that. You also, maybe you cannot see, but you also have Tim Simmons, uh, Dr. Gregory Bostic, uh, Dr. Williams, as well as Ashton Price in this picture. This is some of the planning committee, put a lot of work into this, and now it's given to the people. Now it's given to the men to take on um, so they can lead it and move us into that next phase of this organization. So if you want more information, we, you can get more information from Sekou Smith in the HR department, but just an incredible afternoon that we had. Dr. Green came out and spoke to the group and a quick connection from this slide to the last one. Dr. Green, I don't know if you realize this, but when you spoke, a young man gave you some flowers. And the flowers, uh, that young man actually is the grandson of Bob Hayes. And Bob Hayes is the invitational track meet that Coach Day put on. So talk about full circle. So we have history, making history with this group, but also we're recruiting the next generation. Like 
the, the history and the names that you see on these, on the, in these posters and these, and these books, their kids, their grandkids are growing up in our community and teaching in our schools. So I thought that was a powerful, powerful moment. I didn't even know that until he got off the stage and said, yeah, I'm the grandson of Bob Hayes. So I thought that was incredible. So the ones is an initiative and we're excited about that moving forward. But just in general, I think we, we're at a moment now where uh, we, we have to do all we can to recruit and retain our teachers. We have some of the highest vacancies that we've ever had. And I think it's really important just to note, like, not just with our African-American um, teachers, but our Latino educators as well. It's important to increase the numbers there, but it's important to just really just have a robust group coming in. We need a quality teacher in front of every single one of our kids every single day. And if we can't do that, then we're not doing what we need to do. So we have to put every effort that we can into it. The ones is part of that. I wanna thank Vicki Schultz for all the efforts that she puts in every single day. And it's gonna take all of us to make sure that we recruit and retain great talent in Duval County. So just wanted to make sure that we realize that um, as we're moving forward. Lastly, before I get out of your way, um, I know there's a lot of great, great information that the sales surtax committee um, has when they do their, their sessions when they meet. They're also gonna be pushing out an annual report that's gonna be coming out on March 8th. So if you have not been to those or, or, or even if you have, this is gonna be an amazing report that you're, it's gonna highlight some of the fiscal stewardship pieces of it, as well as the accountability measures that we have in place. So I'm very excited to read this report. I hope that everyone will take advantage and really read that up. And then when we come back to that next oversight committee, you'll be able to see some of that report in action as we move forward. So that group has done an amazing job. They're a group of volunteers who have volunteered their time to support us with this committee. So I just give them praise and kudos for doing that and cannot wait to see this report on March 8th because it's gonna have some very valuable information for us to learn from and glean from as we move forward. So that is all for me. I wanted to just make sure I, I listed out those pieces, but thank you so much for your time tonight. And I will now shift it over to the superintendent for the superintendent's report. Thank you, Chairman Willie. This evening, we have an item uh, on the agenda under discussion, and it is about the resolution for a one mill referendum. And before we get to that item, I felt it was important for the community, the public that is watching, to share a very similar presentation that I shared with the board at the last workshop. Um, normally, my report is try to keep it 10 slides or less, but this is going to be a little longer, and so I will try to move through slides and just keep talking. And that way, hopefully, it won't seem that it was uh, as long as, as it can be. But when we look at the teacher crisis, Chairman Willie just talked about we, we are experiencing the, the largest teacher shortage uh, probably in Duval County's history. And in addition to that, it's not just teacher shortage. We actually have shortages in many positions, such as paraprofessionals, uh, whether it is uh, other support personnel, whether it's uh, under operations, maintenance, or at the district office. In total, we now have over 1,050 vacant positions. Tonight, what I would like to do is to share the background of why we are bringing this resolution to the board. So we have two problems that we want to explore tonight. It's the battle over human capital and then offering exceptional student experiences. Uh, as stated, we are experiencing a not only local teacher shortage, but it is a national teacher shortage, and it's, it's reached at a, a crisis uh, level. Today, we have over 400 teacher vacancies, and as I stated, at the time of this slide, it was 1,000 staff vacancies, and as I uh, just stated, it's now 1,047 vacancies. We are competing more than ever with private industry and neighboring school districts. In the past, we, we, we challenged with hiring with neighbor school districts or other school districts. Well, now we are also being challenged with hiring with private industry. In addition, we have continued to, uh, 
focus on offering exceptional student experiences in our schools. There are two areas that we do not receive categorical funding for. That means the funding is specifically to be used for a, a certain item. And the two areas are the arts and athletics. So part of what we want to talk about tonight is also how do we uh, improve the conditions of these two areas in our schools. We need to shore up supply needs in art, music, and athletics. Um, as stated, there's no specific categorical funding that exists for things such as new instruments, uniforms, playgrounds, and even though we state turf fields, we also our softball fields, our baseball fields, and upgrading the, uh, those uh, areas that relate to uh, athletics. But the first, and I think the most important aspect of what I want to talk about tonight is the classroom teacher. And effective, after effective parenting, the number one determinant of student success is having an outstanding teacher. That is our goal each and every day, to ensure that our students have an outstanding teacher standing uh, before them. But when you have vacancies that hover over 400, and when you see this chart, it says 466. We in, these are instructional vacancies. Instructional means you can be a media specialist, a guidance counselor, um, another teach, a certified position that is outside of the classroom. So today we have 466 vacancies, which has been an increase of 155% over the past six years. And since the pandemic, that was an increase of 98%. As we look at why we have these vacancies, we are seeing that it is not just because less teachers are coming out of the College of Education to hire, it's also that our experienced teachers are leaving. They're leaving sooner than they would have in the past. We are finding that teachers who may say, I, I can do five more years before I retire, are making a decision, no, I'm not going to do five more years. Or te young teachers who have only been in the profession for less than six years are making the decision, I, I think I want to do something else. We continue to hire teachers, but I believe HR would say for every three teachers we hire, we're probably losing six on the same day that we hired three. So when we look at why are we losing teachers, and this is actually based on a national issue, not this is not unique to Duval County, is that now the business world is seeing the value of teachers. They see them as excellent employees. Uh, here's a quote from the Wall Street Journal. Teachers tend to have a broad set of skills that are really attractive to other employers across industries. Things like the ability to absorb and transmit information and communicate clearly make teachers really attractive candidates to lots of different industries. And we are seeing uh, that as an example in Duval County. Uh, I just spoke this week with a teacher who, um, she was very kind to let me know that she was resigning. And in talking to this teacher, she just indicated I need this ability to be, be more flexible, to be able to work from home. And we thought we had convinced her that we could support her in that way, but two days later that teacher still decided to resign and look at other opportunities. And many of those opportunities are now with private industry that are giving that type of flexibility to employees to work from home. We also are not competitive with the seven largest school districts in the state of Florida. Uh, Duval is ranked 40th out of 69 school districts in average teacher salary for the school year 2021. When we look at the seven largest districts in the state of Florida that are listed in the chart, you can see Duval is at the end with the average teacher salary uh, a little close to 47500 And the Miami-Dade, Palm Beach, Broward, and Pinellas all have a one mil 
supplement supported, I shouldn't say one mil because Pinellas is a 0.5, but they have between a 0.5 to one mil uh, supported supplement, and that's the teal part of that chart. And so when you look at Palm Beach County, the average teacher ranges from 50, a little over 54,000 to uh, over 63,000. And again, as you see, Duval is at $47,458.26. It is not just looking at the average teacher salary. And the reason we look at average teacher salary because to get to that point, a teacher would need to have taught uh, in the past over 17 years of experience. Now, fortunately, Governor DeSantis put out, wanted to raise the beginning teacher salary starting two years ago. And school districts have received funding to raise just the beginning teacher salary and little to no funding to uh, add that same level of increase to veteran teachers. And so with that, two years ago, the beginning teacher salary in Duval County was 39,500. Today, the beginning teacher salary is 47,500. The problem is you have a 17 year veteran teacher who may only make a little over a thousand dollars than a teacher who 17 days came out of college and is now teaching. And so you have individuals that have a vast amount of experience uh, making almost the same as individuals who are novice in the profession. When we look at the problem of the impact of teacher effectiveness, it is not, as I stated, it is not just a Duval County problem. It is a state of Florida problem. Data from the Horizon 2040 project, um, which is the Florida Council 100, this data was collected in um, August of 2019. It looked at Florida's low-income schools have half as many highly effective teachers, but twice as many unsatisfactory teachers as other schools. We are very fortunate that uh, when we look at our data, it is not quite to that level, that we, ha we still have highly effective teachers teaching in um, low-income schools. However, we have data that shows the vast majority of our experienced teachers are not teaching in low-income schools. And this can create um, the problem of closing that achievement gap. When we look at teacher experience and that quote that I just said that in Florida schools, um, more than half as many highly effective teachers are teaching in low income schools, but twice as many unsatisfactory teachers in other schools. Likewise, we also have less experienced teachers in our schools that are generally schools of poverty, low uh, income schools, and schools that struggle academically. This data that I'm sharing here is the average years of experience by school grade. So when you see the category of A, that is for schools that are rated A, the average teaching experience is 15.1%. For schools rated as F, and this data was from 2018-19, that was our last um, FSA data before the pandemic. Um, so we do not have any F schools at this time, but at that time, the average experience of a teacher in a school rated F was only 9.4. So when you look at the difference of years of experience, there is 5.7 years of experience difference from an A rated school to a school rated F in Duval. Why is that important? It's important because the next slide I'm going to show you is that experience does matter. Experience plays a role in the effectiveness of teachers in the classroom. When we look at our teachers who are rated highly effective, that is the highest rating a teacher can receive, if you look at it by te teachers by years of experience, teachers with one to five years of experience, only 10.7% of those teachers are rated highly effective. 
And as you see the years continue all the way up to, yes, we do have, uh, we have two teachers in our district that have 45 years of experience. And I believe most of it is in Duval. You see the highly effective rating, highly effective rating go up. So looking at 16 to 20 years, 35, a little over 35% of the teachers are rated highly effective. And that is the point, if, if you remembered, I stated that uh, average teacher salary was about 47.5, and that would be a teacher somewhere between 16 to 17 years. These teachers are, are making very minimally over the teachers that are in years one to five. And as you can see, a higher percentage of those teachers are highly effective. This is important because, as I stated at the beginning, it is not enough for us to keep hiring new teachers coming out of college. But the problem is we are losing our veteran teachers. We are losing the teachers who have the most experience to impact student achievement. And when we look at Duval ranked across the state, we are ranked 58th out of 69 for average teacher experience. Um, the green, the districts that are highlighted in green are our surrounding districts. So the first green bar is St. John's County. It, its teacher experience far out exceeds the teacher experience in Duval County. So teaching experience matters. We have to be able to keep our veteran teachers. So we have a problem with recruiting new teachers because the College of Education is just not putting out the number of teachers that they, that they have in the past. And then we have the problem of retaining our teachers, that they now have other options that uh, either pay just as well or pay more for their services. So this is the main issue with teacher um, recruitment and, and retaining our teachers. But as I stated in the beginning, it's not just teachers. We are also having a, 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 an issue keeping paraprofessionals. Paraprofessionals are the individuals who support the teacher in the classroom. Most of our paraprofessionals are supporting uh, teachers who teach ESE students, uh, exceptional student education or students with disabilities, these are classrooms that need that additional support. We are experiencing 55% vacancy rate higher than we did this time last year. Uh, we have close to 380 paraprofessional vacancies. And this board uh, was visionary to go ahead and move to a $15 per hour for all of the positions in the district that weren't currently being paid at $15 an hour. But as you can see on this chart, we're still not competitive. These a customer service rep, delivery associate, cashier, warehouse associate, these are current job openings in Duval County that are currently paying more than what we pay our paraprofessionals at $15 an hour. So we continue to um, see that the struggle is we have to be more competitive, not only with our surrounding districts, but now with private industry. As I stated, the second part of this was to um, improve exceptional student experiences which the two categories that I talked about were the arts and athletics. Um, we are experiencing a, a, a time or a crossroads in our district where many of our uh, theaters, whether they're lighting equipment, their soundboard equipment, or cafetoriums, speaker systems, these are all coming to a place where they need to be um, replaced. They've been repaired, 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 but now it's time to replace these um, resources that are in our schools. So the goal uh, of moving forward is to address obsolete equipment, upgrades and repair um, existing equipment that still can uh, just be repaired instead of being replaced uh, with additional music instruments, 
Um, we have major band uniform needs for our, our secondary schools, as well as athletics. Um, we want to address and repair um, the plethora of scoreboards. Uh, we used to receive funding through uh, whether it was Coke or Pepsi. We no longer receive that level of funding from um, either of those vendors through our beverage uh, contract. And now these scoreboards need to be um, replaced. Um, upgrading our athletic fields. Uh, we have 60 playgrounds that are um, well over 20 years old that need to be replaced. Gym floors, bleachers, and tracks. Um, I do want to highlight when I, when I speak about playgrounds, these are playgrounds for schools that are not being replaced. So it is not if we're building a brand new school, of course a new playground would come with that school. But these are playgrounds that the school it may be renovated or excuse me, or um, having their FCI updated, but they're not scheduled or slated to uh, be replaced. So when I presented this to the board, it, the question was, uh, what's the path forward? And my recommendation was to request for a resolution which must be brought to the board during a regular uh, scheduled school board meeting to introduce a resolution for a ballot measure for a one mil increase. Um, the, uh, a, that one mil increase would be for four specific things. Addressing uh, teacher and staff compensation, charter schools, which are required by law to receive their uh, fair share, and arts and athletics. And that, is, that resolution address all four of those items and that is the only thing those dollars can be utilized for if the resolution is uh, successful here and, and it makes it on the ballot and if it passes on the ballot. Currently there are 20 school districts that have passed uh, what a millage referendum. Uh, these 20 districts or 20 counties have used them for a variety of reasons from everything from compensation to um, hiring uh, safety security officers, uh, arts, athletics, uh, hiring um, social workers or mental health therapists. Each district makes that decision about what they need that additional millage for and they must address it through their resolution. So what does one mil garner for the school district? A one mil increase would estimate about $82 million that would be generated per year. When we looked at the areas um, uh, of addressing what would we use those dollars for, this pie talks about 75% of those dollars would be used for compensation for teachers and staff. 12.5% uh, is currently the equal share for charter schools and 12.5% would be utilized for arts and athletics. So what is the timetable for this? Today the board will has under consideration the resolution on March 1st. If that consideration is in the positive, we have until March 16th to have that uh, resolution to the City Council and the legislation will be filed by March 16th. By April 26th, uh, hopefully the final City Council consideration of the resolution uh, that is needed so that it can be delivered to the Supervisor of Elections with the final ballot language being submitted with the primary election would be on August 23rd, 2022. So when we brought this forward to the board, um, it, it w we made it clear that even by adding this one mill, we are not where we were over 10 years ago with millage. The state has mandated a state study decline, and we call it the rollback, and required local millage. We roll it back. Uh, generally, each year in the month of July, I read that long resolution and, and state what is the rollback of the millage. Um, in 2010, our millage was 5.346. Today, it is 3.56. Uh, 
Um, so from that time to this time, if the millage had stayed the same, it, it, we, we would have earned over $657 million over those years. So even if the one mill was to pass on the referendum, we would still be lower than where we were in 2010-11. Also, we will still be lower where we were in 2007-2008 when the millage rate was at 4.879. So what does a one mill increase mean to homeowners? Because that is the individual that would pay me and this clicker aren't working well tonight. Um, that is where that funding comes from. So a one mil equals $1 per 1,000 of the assessed value less homestead exemption. So an owner who has a, a home that is valued of $225,000, um, then you apply homestead exemption, that homeowner would pay approximately $17 a month for a one mil increase. So that basically covers what I shared with the board at the workshop. And as stated, this resolution will now be under consideration when the uh, chairman gets to that particular item. And this is the information that I've shared with the board and now I will have shared it with our community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Green, for that report. We do not have a sales surtax overview report or department reports for this evening, but we do want to move on to the public comments portion. Um, we are now in the public comment portion of our agenda. The school board welcomes your comments on matters that are before the board for consideration. It is not the board's intent to respond this evening, but to use the input in our deliberations. To give everyone appropriate respect and courtesy, we ask the audience to refrain from audible comments or applause. When you come to the microphone, please state your name for the record. Please limit your comments to three minutes. When the green light in front of me starts to blink, you will have a minute remaining. When the light turns yellow, you will have 30 seconds remaining. When it turns red and the buzzer sounds, your time will be up. If your concerns exceed that time, you may pre present written comments to the board. Board policy provides for an orderly and efficient meeting without disruption by words or actions. You are asked to refrain from references to specific individuals and to follow expectations for civil discourse. In an effort to mitigate against the spread of COVID-19, we have placed hand sanitizer and disinfectant wipes at the podium. We ask that each speaker wipe down the microphone and podium before they address the board. Please remember, speaker cards were only accepted until 6.20. PM. We thank you very much for taking time to address the board. Vice Chair, I will turn it over to you. All right. Uh, Chairperson Willie, we have 15 speaker cards for this evening. We'll start with Rachel Tutwiler Fortune, followed by Rachel Duff. I'm the first one. I don't need to wipe it. Oh, is it on? All right, well, esteemed uh, members of the Duval County School Board, uh, I am here tonight in light of discussions around the um, advocating for the millage uh, tax. I'm here to express the support of the Jacksonville Public Education Fund in this effort, as well as to just highlight some of our historical research um, around building teacher pipelines and teacher compensation. Uh, first, I want you to know that you have my support personally as a partner in this work, um, as a former teacher, as well as a former student and as a parent of children learning in the 21st century um, in our community. Um, I also want you to know you have the full support of our staff as well as our board in ensuring that advocacy efforts around the referendum will be robust in hopes of seeing an official millage increase uh, to directly impact the rates of teacher compensation in our community in particular. Uh, JPEF does have significant historical research um, that I hope is helpful to your decision tonight uh, as you consider moving forward with this potential ballot measure. Um, we have research literally over the last decade that highlights how difficult it has been to attract talent to our school specifically um, in the millennial generation um, and they're just not as attracted to the profession because of compensation in part. We also had studies as recently as 20, 
21 that really shined a light on um, the cost of teacher turnover. So we know that we're in a particularly dire situation in this COVID context right now, um, but very much concerned that when we lose teachers, we also have um, the district having to pay up to $11,000 per um, teacher that um, is lost. And in that particular year, about $12 million um, going into just those transitional costs on top of um, adequately trying to then compensate teachers that were attracted. Um, I also want you to know that since 2013, we've conducted polls uh, of the community, and each year we ask questions about teacher compensation, saw that there was considerable support from the community for um, a small tax increase that would support uh, um, public education period, but also teacher compensation specifically when we ask questions about that. Um, so overall, um, I just want you to know that we stand as a partner with you in this work and look forward to hopefully um, ensuring our community has all the information it needs to seriously consider um, the value that this could place on our teachers and helping them see how much uh, we really value them in our community. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now have Rachel Duff followed by Frank DeLong. Good evening. My name is Rachel Duff, and I'm here to express my full support of placing a one mil increase on the ballot for the people of Jacksonville to vote for, hopefully in favor with the goal of increasing teacher pay. I taught for Duval County Public Schools as a middle school teacher for five years, and I know firsthand how tight money can be when living with the single income of a public school teacher. It is challenging physically, mentally and emotionally to often find yourself living paycheck to paycheck when you're contributing to one of the most important professions in our society. In 2019, I was a top five finalist for Teacher of the Year, and while I found myself recognized, celebrated, and valued um, by the community and by the school board in my school, that did not necessarily reflect in the pay I received. Teachers are pillars in our society, caring for and cultivating responsible, kind, confident young people who will go on to contribute to our world in various ways. As a city, we can decide where we place value and our monetary priorities reflect that. To state it simply, teachers deserve to be well compensated for the service they provide to our children, our community, and our society as a whole. I currently serve as the data and research manager for the Jacksonville Public Education Fund and through years of research and public opinion polling, as Rachel mentioned, we have found that people respond in full support for tax increases that would supplement teacher salaries. Additionally, research has shown that sufficiently compensated teachers are more satisfied with their work, motivated to stay, and are linked to better student outcomes. Over half of the teachers that we recently interviewed in our own study for the 1000 by 2025 initiative brought up inadequate compensation as a barrier to recruiting and retaining more black and Latino men in the classroom. I urge the board to vote in favor for this measure for the good of teachers, children, and our city. Thank you. Thank you. We will now have Frank DeLong followed by David Pinter. Good evening. Frank DeLong, IBW 177 Chairman. I came here tonight to complain about taxpayer waste which exists in our schools. For instance, the plan to put AstroTurf on at high school football fields. But that changed the mission when I read an email regarding that your paraprofessionals do not get paid what warehouse workers get paid in the real world. Here's a news flash. Your warehouse workers don't get paid what warehouse workers get paid in the real world. Since 2001, inflation has risen 57.43% here in Jacksonville. Maintenance has gotten 30.5% in that time is pay raises. We're 26.93% behind the eight ball. Maintenance went for seven years without a pay raise. And when we got one, starting salaries did not go up. We didn't get the $1,000 for working through COVID and no one heard us whining every day as we literally stood shoulder to shoulder, putting together hundreds of thousands of death shields. No tears were shed or even mentioned when of the maintenance workers died. We cannot get employees to stay. 
they're leaving and the people do not want to work here because the pay is so low. Apprentices are almost getting paid what you're starting salaries for licensed tradesmen, 1924. The outside world licensed tradesmen are receiving 32 to 37 dollars an hour. Unfortunately, your starting practices are now, if they can breathe, hire them. We are in no way competitive with the market. And almost every email you send out is about teachers, even tonight. Main maintenance maintains about 200 schools. We have warned you for years that a storm is coming, but to no avail. Now the storm is here. You're surrounded by water. It's time to do something. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now have David Pinter, followed by Carnell Oliver. Honorable board members, Superintendent Green, uh, my name's David Pinter. It's an honor to speak to you tonight on behalf of the millage rate offering my support and encouraging you to support this referendum, if you will. While I know many people in this room, there are many that I do not know, so I'd like to give you some perspective on my perspective of why I'm asking you to support this. I'm a native Floridian. I've lived almost 60 years in Northeast Florida. I also served as 40 years as a public educator, just shy of 40 years, I should say. 35 of those years were here in Duval County. I loved it. I served as a teacher, an assistant principal here, vice principal, principal, and a director with Ms. Peak in the school choice office. I served in nine different schools in Duval County from Mary McLeod Bethune to Martin Luther King to the beaches, Alamakani, all over the district. And I loved it. <clears throat> What I found when I started my career in 1982 is that teachers struggle with the pay. I found out very quickly after three months I had to take a second job. Most educators do. For 17 years, ladies and gentlemen, I worked a second job and that was even with a master's degree. The state was supposed to help us with all this with the lottery. I won't get into all of it. You know what happened, 60%. We're down into the 30%. The lottery money was supposed to make up the difference. It did not. I could show you in a side conversation how the failure for the state to do that has cost Duval County alone over $50 million a year in revenue. That would make this discussion not even necessary, but it's not there. So I applaud the superintendent and her boldness for putting this before us. I'm asking you to do it for three reasons. Number one, what we could do to bring in people who really want to be in this field. Number two, how we help compensate for teachers at the mid and upper level. As the superintendent has presented, the state has taken care of upping the beginning teacher salary, but there's nothing that they supply to help middle and upper. And then the third is it would be a visionary move by this board for what is coming down the pipe. For many years, I had teachers in the, excuse me, I had friends in the public sector, private sector, who said they wanted to come to public education, but they couldn't because of the money that they would lose. So let's give them a just, fair, and profitable salary, along with the people that we have to keep them and to sustain them. And then visionary for what it would do for Duval County and this area in attracting I know we're in the Thank real you. estate and all those types of things, so Thank I you. just what I could do on that side. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now have David, um, I'm sorry, Carnell Oliver, followed by Sonny Bartley. Uh, yes, uh, Carnell Oliver, um, address is on file. You can't do no better than somebody who actually knows the institution. And as I sit there and I listen to the superintendent's report, one of the things came to my mind is that I took some time before I even started to show my support for this. I went to Rains High, talked to a few teachers, and I went to Maddie V, talked to some of the instructors. 
And I wanted to really get a better understanding of what we're actually up, up against. You know, somebody highlighted something about supply chain, inflation. Now I want you to consider the human infrastructure when it comes down to social development. Social development has everything to do with teachable knowledge that can build something greater for a generation can build on. And for me, and as I think about teachers, they're part of this supply chain situation that we're in. We're dealing with a sim simple flat fact that we have the books, we have the technology, but we don't have the supply of teachers. So there's going to be necessary sacrifices that are going to come from this community to meet the needs of our fair market of building a future that is greater than my own. So if we look at it in the long run, look at it that we're building something that nobody can take away because knowledge is the most powerful thing that we can give somebody that comes behind us. And that is what this is really all about. <clears throat> As building and maintenance is, is complaining about um, certain financial issues, I would honestly say go through the Florida House budgetary committees. Do your own personal research. You get to see what exactly the Florida legislator is allocating dollars for and why we're not getting our fair share of funding. Your raises would go up if the state gave us our fair share. And it makes me want to ask the liaison of our Florida um, Association of School Boards to reach out, find out what they can do to reform the Florida lottery system so that we can get our fair share. That should be a responsibility uh, that can make everybody happy. That way that we don't have to continue to raise taxes just to give the value of teachers they deserve. And I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Sonny Bartley, followed by Ronnie, Dur I believe it's During. My name is Sonny Bartley. Good evening. Tell a big enough lie repeatedly, eventually people will believe it. We're three years into the Wuhan China virus, AKA China, uh, COVID-19, or is it the Delta variant, the Omicron, the Omicron BA.2, Florona, Delta Crohn, Stealth Omicron, and the HIV variant. I believe they close their eyes, grab a medical dictionary, and point to the next fear-mongering virus. This has become a collaborated three-ring circus by Fauci the fraud, FDA, CDC, NIH, and the WHO, as the disingenuous mainstream media spread the propaganda that therapeutics like ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, bedazinide, mono mon monoclonal clinics are either ineffective or laden with life-threatening side effects that could end your life instantly. When the deadly experimental vaccines are actually ineffective and laden with lethal consequences, are you going to believe me or the Marxist media that told us the 2020 BLM Antifa riots, destructions, <laughs> violent fatal assaults, and chaos were mostly peaceful, as we saw in real time cities burning to the ground all across America? One, major, one mayor amongst the, the mayhem and atrocities in our city saw it as a summer of love. What am I saying? This virus has been prostituted like a $10 whore. There never should have been a pandemic and no need for vaccines. I contracted COVID-19 like Joe Rogan, the NFL secretly, the, poli the political cesspool on Capitol Hill secretly, and many thousands around the world were treated and cured by I ivermectin, a 40-year-old safe and FDA-approved medication that won a Nobel Prize in 2015 for curing just about any disease it came in contact with. And in March of 2020, we learned it cured COVID-19, but it is still being blocked, hidden, vilified, censored, and demonized as medical misinformation. Just ask Joe Rogan Logan, he is being roasted and threatened for sharing ivermectin to his over 11 million a day fan base. Dr. Robert Malone, a vaccine scientist who invented the mRNA technology, was banned by big tech. Can anyone tell me for two whole years where has the flu gone? Does any, anything I've just said thus far 
raise any serious concerns. So why are we pushing vaccines to healthy school-aged children with strong immune systems as young as five years old? And how do corrupt pharmaceuticals want to give the jab to infants as young as six months? I had a gentleman get angry at me for, for talking about the dangers of the vaccines because he, he and his family got the jab and were doing fine. I said, thank God you and your family are doing well. I pray that, that they continue to be be the case down the road, but tell that to the many thousands that have died and had life altering adverse effects from the vaccines. I continue just because just because a tragedy hasn't happened in your house. Thank you. Thank you. There were 12,612 12 deaths you. in the Thank bear. you. Your time has expired. Thank you. Ronnie uh, Durig. I'm sorry. I'm uh, on your last name, um, followed by Rich Richard Cuff. Hello, my name is Ronnie Burris, and I am the business manager of Lyona Local 630, and I'm here for two reasons tonight. One, I represent health services, and their contract's going to be coming in front of you uh, tonight. <clears throat> I'm going to ask that you pass that, but I also want to talk to you about what's going on in the school board here now, is that you're a training ground. You hire people. You bring them in, they stay, they get the training, and then they leave and go somewhere and make two or three times more money. It's ha I see it all the time. When we organized the nurses, we had 55, you had 55 nurses in the school board. Today we have 39 and there's 44 openings. That's because of the money. That's because they get hired and they're a float nurse and they go from school to school. You hire them and pay them $19 an hour and they're paying $320 a month to go from school to school. There's, a, there's something wrong. We need to fix that and the only way to do it is for the millage. Let me also say that I represent IT, another group, same thing. They, leave, they come in. Jim does a great job in, rep in teaching them, but then they go and make a lot more money. So <clears throat> I represent 27 pu public employee contracts throughout the state of Florida. You're the only school board, but I can tell you the counties and the cities are having all the same problems, every one of them. You can't hire nobody. You can't. Bringing people in at $15 an hour is great, but it, just yesterday, Target said, well, we're going to go to $24 an hour. So what do you do? How do you handle that? You can't. You can't compete with that where we're at right now. I think it's important that this board takes into consideration what's happening in this country in public employment for sure. And I hope this millage rate will pass because this isn't be about being a Democrat or a Republican. This is about the children and it's about getting them what they need because they're our future. 50 years from now, we probably won't be sitting here. I probably won't be standing here, but it's about, they will be. So it's important, please, to take, think about this and take it into consideration and support this referendum. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now have Richard Cuff followed by Andy Brook. Um, thank you guys so much. My name is Richard Cuff. I am um, and thank you Dr. Dr. Green and, and, and the board. Um, I'm in support 100% of the referendum. Um, for the past 15 years, my colleague Andy Bruck and I have been working in the early childhood music space. Um, we have the only program that teaches three and four year olds to play violin in preschool. Uh, we've yet to receive any federal funding for it. Every dime has been paid for by myself and Mr. Bruck, but we find a way to do it. 
The one thing that I know, I don't have a lot of studies, we don't have the dollars to do that, but I can tell you I've watched the faces of these kids light up when they finally play that first note and it doesn't sound like they're killing a cat. <laughs> um, it's, uh, the impact that you have on these children is amazing. I know for a fact that 90% of a child's brain is developed by the time they're six years old. So that, that birth to six years old is so important. That 12.5% of that $81 million is about $10 million that can go to arts funding. If you were to put that $10 million at the early childhood stage, by the time they're 14 years old, it will return $130 million of funds that we're not spending on additional police officers or any other issues. The proof is in the pudding. I stand here to say, let's get this done. Let's talk about something that we can put into place for the next 20 years. I guarantee you, you'll get entrepreneurs, organizations that will find a way to come in and meet you halfway because the innovation will be there. You've got your number one advocate in entrepreneurs who find innovative ways to get it done, and we just need a little bit more help. The funding is there. I know I can get more people to come and work with us. If the funding is not there, I know I'm going to do this for the rest of my life with every dime that's in my pocket because nothing, I'm telling you, nothing warms your heart more than watching a child grow up, become a wonderful musician, and do what my daughter is doing, about to graduate from University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music with her master's degree in violin um, from Stetson, I mean, uh, University of Cincinnati, and she graduated from Douglas Anderson School of the Arts. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm 100% on board. You got me. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we'll now have Andy Brock, please, followed by Natalie Dreyer. Good evening. I'm Andy Bruck, a professional violinist and the current president of American Federation of Musicians Local 444 in Jacksonville. And I have worked with Richard Cup, the previous speaker. It's been my pleasure and honor to associate, be associated in a number of educational projects. A few years ago, I took a course which encouraged musicians to consider whether we can contribute to the quality of life in our communities in roles other than simply performing and teaching our crafts. In recent months, I began to wonder how the arts could help address climate change as the threats it poses seem to loom ever larger. This process ultimately led me to create a project for young people that I will be sharing with you shortly. This week, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published its latest report based on hundreds of scientists' assessments of thousands of scientific publications on the consequences of climate change and ways of adapting to it. One of its lead authors observed that there are far-reaching risks and damages to environmental systems and people can no longer, uh, that can no longer be avoided in many places. The greatest climate risks are faced in regions with the highest temperature increases on coasts, along rivers, and in mountain ranges, unquote. Also equally related to my purpose here tonight, Last year, The Lancet published results of a survey of 10,000 16 to 25-year-olds in 10 countries on how they felt about climate change and the government's responses. It found that, quote, the emotional, cognitive, social, and functional burdens of climate change are profoundly affecting huge numbers of young people around the world. And finally, relevant to our continuing to cope with COVID-19, a 2010 paper in the journal Nature found in mounting evidence that biodiversity loss, which is in part triggered by climate change, increases the transmission of diseases by removing species that could help absorb their impact. <clears throat> These findings give added weight to a project that our Musicians Local is organizing, a lyric writing contest for Duval County Public High School students on the topic of how to proactively address the climate crisis. We will be providing complete details about this contest in the coming weeks and uh, hope to run this in the month of April. We are currently putting together uh, judges and we are seeking sponsors for a grand prize as well as hopefully additional cash prizes. And the grand prize winner will get their lyrics set to music and recorded either as a song by a professional singer-songwriter or as a tone poem with narrator along the lines of Aaron Copeland's 
uh, Lincoln portrait. Either version will also include a chamber orchestra. Our wish is that this contest will provide a creative, constructive outlet for our students, something that they can then share with and sir, inspire the rest of our community. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now have Natalie Dreyer, followed by Rebecca Nathanson. Good evening. I'm Natalie Dreyer. I'm the mom to two amazing middle school students. A wise woman once taught me that money does not fix money problems. I'm here to ask you to not approve the superintendent's request to add a millage increase to Jacksonville's homeowners. Now first, I do believe that teachers deserve high quality pay. But as you mentioned, Duval County ranks 40th for teachers pay in our state's 40, 69 counties. Being 40th, even getting to 40th, demonstrates that you have not valued teacher salaries. But our principals are ranked third in the state. What message is that sending to your teachers? They have not been your priority. This board has been funding failure. Funding failure time and time again. We've been here throughout the year asking you to avoid costly and losing litigation and remove programmings that do not support the core values of education. Our middle schoolers have a 42% literacy rate. Focus on that instead of the programs that uh, instead of programs that you have to connect our minor children to text or chat with an anonymous person about sex, like your birds and bees partnership, or the large contract the large contracts you've issued with Hazel Health to bring video doctors to the campuses with little to no public discussion about privacy rights or parental notification. Even tonight, you are recommending to give Teacher America another nine hundred and sixty-seven thousand dollars for teacher recruitment through two twenty twenty-five. It's also a no-fault contract. If they fail to perform, they still get paid. If they over-deliver, they get a bonus. So to all the teachers out there, parents believe that you deserve the actual bonus instead. Do you even try to negotiate these contracts? Or is it always just another big rubber stamp and handshake? You write the checks. These organizations need you. It's not the other way around. And this is just tonight's example. There's plenty on every agenda I've ever seen. And in case no one knows, Teacher, Teacher America is designed to produce short-term teachers. Do we really need more short-term candidates? Parents want long-term educators. Children deserve committed and long-term educators. How many teachers are simply exhausted from being micromanaged? How many teachers are struggling with discipline issues? How many teachers are struggling with morale? How many teachers cannot get the district to approve their supplies? Many teachers are grieving over the lost art of teaching. They are often reduced to managing an abundance of programs that outsource their talents and gifts. Do you really think another $5,000 a year, which works out to about $96 a week, do you think that's going to make them stay? Use tonight's $967,000 to fund solutions for your teaching staff. Does the public know that we just approved a $2 million contract with Reed USA to do largely the same thing with another nonprofit that Duval, called Duval Reads that has been doing since 1999 through funding from the district? Why the second provider? Why in 23 years has the district not figured out a way to pay teachers for the same service and send that money directly to the women and men that we trust to educate, and to educate our children? Thank you so much. Rebecca, we'll now have Rebecca Nathanson followed by Kim Stevens-Perry. As was just stated, 42% um, of our middle schoolers read at grade level. Um, we see lots and lots of money approved over and over again to go towards nonprofits and outside vendors. And we would like to see the money go more to teachers um, and as well as charter schools. I appreciate that the superintendent's presentation said that 12.5% if it passes will go to charter schools. I have a son in a charter school. Um, that produces better results with a lower cost per pupil and um, students are fleeing to charter schools at an alarming rate about two thousand dollars two thousand students per year in recent years and it's going to explode as more people are moving to cho uh, Florida for school choice I want our public schools to succeed I'm a product of Wolfson High School all the Duval County Public Schools, graduated from Wolfson. Um, but I just want 
you could to consider not asking voters to just simply add money to something that's not working. Uh, it seems like it's only government that we're continually asked to throw money at when we're not seeing the results that we should see in our community. Taxpayers are not interested in funding failure, including funneling money towards more consultants and nonprofits. We'd like to see you all take a leadership role in building solutions to create success and harmony. Once you design that, people would be happy to give you more money um, when we see where the money's going and that it's going to teachers. Um, we would like teachers to get more money and we'd like to see you stop paying nonprofits and ed tech vendors to do the job of teachers. I believe our brightest days are ahead of us if we have the courage to do things differently. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now have Kim Stevens Perry followed by Casey Jones. Good evening. My name is Kim Stevens Perry and I was educated on military bases and in public schools. I am in support of teacher salary increase. However, I do not agree with increasing property taxes to cover the salary increases. Increasing property taxes will impact current and retired teachers who are property owners. The property tax increase will be passed on to current and retired school board employees who are renters. I do not think that the school board is being run as a business whose focus is education. The reason I state this is that when the sales tax increase was presented to the public in 2020 for buildings, the request for salary should have been raised then. Also, lastly, the school board is sus surplusing assets and selling them under value. The sale of Lake Forest Elementary for one million is grossly undervalued. Therefore, I think that the school board should utilize operational funds coming from schools that have been surplus to increase the um, salaries of their um, teachers and other employees. Athlete, athletes and arts facilities should be handled by the existing sales tax increase and I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now have Casey Jones followed by Michelle Lomax. How y'all doing? Duval County School fiscal year budget is over 2.1 billion dollars. Are you kidding me? You can't raise teacher salaries and it's 2.1 billion dollars how about tightening the budget and give the maintenance guys a raise how about finding it and giving it and, and giving them five thousand dollars to the teachers that's a joke are you freaking kidding me how about ten thousand dollars they don't get paid enough But you don't need a you don't need to raise millage tax again. It's been 483 days since y'all got a half cent sales tax, and now you grubbling and trying to get another one. Are you kidding me? 483 days. You just got a half a cent sales tax. I, I'm blown away, blown away that y'all, that, that, that somebody's got the nerve to ask for more. I, I mean, I, I, I work 12 hours a day, rushed here to get here before six. And you're going to ask for more taxes. I mean, I still can't, I still got to say it again. $2.1 billion budget. Do you know that's double, over double the amount 
for the whole city of Jacksonville? That's over double the city of Jacksonville. I think it's time to tighten the belt a little bit and make some, some cuts because this is a joke that you can't live and pay the teachers and the maintenance guys a decent salary on $2.1 billion. 483 days since, she, since the voters voted to give you a half a cent sales tax and you got the nerve to ask for more. Jesus. How about selling this big old building on the Dagum River and pay the teachers what they deserve? And the maintenance guys. Has this property been appraised? Thank, thank you. Get it right. Miss uh, Michelle Lomax, followed by Margaret Yarborough. Good evening. My name is Michelle Lomax. I've communicated with you all via email up until now, but I thought it prudent to come tonight to a, thank you so much to uh, let you all know that I do oppose this referendum to further lading the taxpayers, the homeowners of Duval County, with a further burden burden of increasing their millage. As some of you are, may be aware, Jacksonville is trending in growth. Homes are being built all over the city, which means that people are already paying millage. And the city, Duval County Public School, which I'm addressing tonight, your, our, your budget has already been surplus through the movement of people from various states into the city of Jacksonville. So I don't think it's prudent. In my email, I referenced that. I also referenced that families are already trying to make their budget. And you all are considering adding another piece and they're taking another piece from their wallet. I don't think that's prudent as a body. And I think that you all should seriously consider what families are facing. If the children are seeing their parents frustrated and stressed at home, then they can take that to school, which diminishes their ability to learn. We are all in this together. There's someone who said, very wisely said, there's a time for everything. There's a time for everything. And now is not the time for homeowners in Duval County to be laden with another tax burden. They have the, ha the half cent sale tax, which became effective in 2021. We just had the gas tax which became, uh, that's got, that was affected in, I know you guys got 2022, they got, no, this year, sorry, my dates are a little off. You guys got 2021 for your increase. The gas tax became effective this year, 2022. So now you're saying that you wanna come back to the taxpayers again and ask for more money. I'm just asking that you all be prudent. My emails say other reasons why I feel that there is a labor shortage nationally, not just amongst teachers, but, but amongst the whole nation. There are some things that people are facing that they had to take a stand on. Gender dysphoria. Some people had to take a stand on that because they disagree with it. And as teachers, they don't feel that is ethically or morally right for them to teach that. So it's not just one issue that we're looking at. It's multiple things that our teachers are experiencing and that they have to make hard decisions on. And as a homeowner and as a parent who's had three kids who have been through the Duval County Public Schools, we were able to get a great experience because we took advantage of school choice. And I am thankful for that, but there's a time for everything and there's not the time to raise taxes. Thank you, thank you. Um, our last speaker for this evening, Margaret Yarborough. Good evening, my name is Margaret Yarbrough, mom of two incredible girls. Next week, my daughter is supposed to perform with the LaVilla Choir at JU for a required music performance assessment. Because JU does not allow for medical mask exemptions, I'm told my daughter will not be allowed to perform at JU. 
even though my other daughter and most students just performed there maskless a couple weeks ago. While the director was kind and assured me that her grades would not be affected, this is unacceptable. My daughter wants to perform. This is medical discrimination and has caused unnecessary emotional stress for my child. Not much can be done to prevent the spread of COVID unless one wears a properly handled, fitted, sealed, and smell-tested N95 mask. COVID is 0.125 microns in size, similar to the flu. Smoke is up to five times larger than COVID particles. Yet you can smell the fumes from cigarette smoke while wearing cloth and surgical mask. Same with spray paint fumes, which means these, these masks don't work. If the district wants to be in healthcare, then promote actual life-saving practices. Vitamin D is critical for a healthy immune system, protecting against cardiovascular disease, diabetes, MS, certain cancers, and COVID. The FDA recommends a mere 800 IUs of vitamin D daily, even though at least 40% of Americans are deficient. D levels below 30 significantly increase the likelihood of illness and death. The darker your skin, the more vitamin D you need. Around 70% of Hispanics and 80% of African Americans are deficient. I used to get sick all the time because I was deficient but not anymore. The reason COVID disproportionately affects minorities isn't because it's racist, like the media would lead us to believe. It's because pigmentation reduces vitamin D production in the skin. Healthy weight is also critical. Obesity is the biggest health crisis facing Florida and hinders the absorption of vitamin D. This is a dangerous combination for COVID-like illnesses. Why doesn't the district send out updates telling the school community to maintain a healthy weight and get plenty of vitamin D? Instead, schools send out pointless emails and phone calls telling parents how many COVID cases there are, which doesn't prevent illness or death. Also, let's recognize that natural immunity is a good thing, creating a more robust immune system. Put pressure on JU to allow my child to perform without a mask. This is a required school performance, and I have parental rights to decide if my child wears a medical device. The Jacksonville daily COVID average is around 140, which is statistically insignificant. Kids can't sing properly with mask on. I'm following evidence-based science. JU and the district are not. Please do the right thing. Uh, also, I'll add um, property values are way up, and you can pay teachers more without raising taxes. And I think part of the reason that teachers, parents, and, te and students are leaving DCPS is because of these unpopular policies and practices. Um, it's just hard not to address that. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our public speakers for this evening. We will now move on to comments from parent organizations. Just trying to see if I see anyone. I don't see anyone. I know uh, uh, Kay Hawkins let me know that she would not be in attendance tonight. I do not see any other parent organizations. Um, we will not. Uh, we don't have a. A representative from our JAG student organization tonight, but we'll move on to comments from employee organizations. There we see Ms. Terry Brady. Good evening. I stand before each of you tonight in support of the resolution to ask the voters to support a one mil increase in ad valorem taxes. Currently, and as stated earlier, Duval County has over a thousand vacancies in a variety of positions. And within that number, of course, over 400 plus teacher positions. We cannot compete with other districts because of our low pay. As the superintendent mentioned earlier, Duval ranks 40th out of 69 counties for average teacher salaries. It does make a difference when you are recruiting the same number of teachers to come here or Hillsborough or Orange or Dade or Broward. We rank last out of the seven urban districts. Now the Florida legislature that was mentioned earlier did allocate dollars for pay raises, but the dollars as you all know and as we know were mainly for starting salaries. And it was a great bump because we needed to increase starting salaries. I would have never thought in my lifetime and career that beginning salaries would be 47.5 for a beginning teacher. I guarantee you, I did not make that when I first started teaching at John Love Elementary. And I worked two part-time jobs at night and on weekends, so it, it was tough. 
Experienced teachers only receive a small raise out of that legislative allocation, and many of them found themselves making the same or slightly more than a starting teacher's salary. I would like to state, I think the superintendent was being very generous when she said there was a $1,000 difference. Uh, for two steps, there was $381 and $400 difference between a 14 and a 15th year teacher and a beginning teacher. That is such great disparity. The National Education Association, which is one of our national organizations, they surveyed a, a massive nationwide um, survey and they did an oversampling in Florida. And they conducted this survey in January of 2022. And they stated that 50% of teachers plan to leave education sooner than later. And it was mainly because of financial reasons and additional burdens being placed on the classroom teachers throughout this state. In addition to the teacher shortages, we have shortages of paraprofessionals and our United Office Personnel Unit employees. That's who Duval Teachers United represents. These individuals are the backbone of support of our teachers, our students, and this district. They too have increased workloads, longer hours, and increased stress. None of this leads to a happy workforce. Our employees from top to bottom are just tired of being tired. They're covering classes. They're acting as substitutes. They don't get their planning time because they voluntarily go into other classrooms when substitutes cannot be recruited. Paraprofessionals are coming early. They're trying to help on the playground. Our office personnel, we've got, we have elementary schools and, and schools throughout this county that didn't have bookkeepers. It was amazing to me in the Florida statute, the only required position that you have to have is a bookkeeper. It's not required to have X number of teachers. It's not required to have X number of principals or no principal. It's a requirement in state law to have a bookkeeper and our district could not recruit them to come work for us when school began. You know, it was mentioned earlier also that the Target Corporation seeks to entice workers with pay up to $24 an hour starting pay. I listened to a podcast last night from the Target CEO, and he went through all this information, but the biggest thing that really impacted me was he stated that a large investment in its labor workforce is needed now more than ever, and he simply put it, the work market now has changed like it's never changed in the past. 20 school districts have already passed this referendum, similar to what is being proposed this evening. Now is the time for us as an organization, and now is the time for you as our school board members to take action. Let the voters decide and show their support for our district employees and teachers. That's all we're asking is to pass the resolution, to put it on the ballot, to allow the voters to decide if it's right for our employees and our teachers in this county. We're not collaboratively asking to sneak a tax in without the vote of the voters. We're asking the voters to vote in support of this school district and the employees and the teachers. I just ask you and encourage you to please vote yes to pass this resolution that is before you tonight and send it to the city council so the voters of this county can decide is it worth the investment in our schools and is it worth the investment in our employees. I thank you all very much. Thank you, Ms. Brady. Um, recognizing any other employee organizations that we have out there. Welcome back. Manager. So <clears throat> let me just share something with you. The issue, part of the issue is wage compression. They, all these high salaries starting is great. But when you got somebody that has been here for a, a long period of time, I think Terry said 14, 15 years, and there's a $380 difference, that's wage compression. That's a problem. Because your employees that are here, they're looking around going, wait a minute, why am I only making $380 more and I've been here 15 years? 
because I, am I not more valuable than that? Because they are. You know, um, I represent every job that you can imagine in public employment with all my 27 contracts, whatever they may be. But <clears throat> public employment is one of the most impo important things that we have today in this country. And without public employment, and I don't care if you're a school teacher, I don't care if you're IT, I don't care if you're a nurse, I don't care if you're a wastewater operator as I was for 25 years, I don't care if you're a lineman, I don't care. But all those things are necessary. Without those things, we're in trouble. So this resolution is, is very, very important to the public employees that you have in this district and it's just important that we I just ask that you please pass this and so it can go in front of the City Council and I will go personally I will promise you that I have a lot of friends and on the City Council because I represent City of Jacksonville employees also so I have a lot of friends on City Council and I sure don't mind making some phone calls please let this pass so it can get there and let the people decide on what we really need. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burris. I don't see any other employee organizations. We'll now move on to approval of minutes. That the Duval County School Board approved the minutes of the meetings listed in the agenda item. November 9th, 2021 board workshop. January 10th, 2022 regular board meeting. January 19th, 2022 policy handbook review committee. January 27, 2022, board member meeting, Coker Hershey. February 1st, 2022, regular board meeting. February 8th, 2022, board workshop. February 9th, 2022, board member meeting, Coker Hershey. February 15th, 2022, agenda committee meeting. February 15th, 2022, board workshop. Uh, ask for a motion. So moved. Second. second. Moved by board member Anderson, second by board member Hershey. <laughs> uh, any discussion? Hearing and seeing none, call for your vote. Chairman Anderson, I'm sorry. <laughs> Chairman Willie and Board Member Anderson, are you having a problem? Say that again. Are you having a problem, Chair Willie? I had to refresh my refresh oh. Yeah, I don't see it at all. Hold on, we'll refresh. <coughs> you want me to do a hand vote? Yay. Excellent. By your actions, you have approved this item 7-0. Now we'll move on to approval of consent agenda. Are there any items to be placed on the consent agenda or items for discussion? Okay. Uh, ask for a motion. So moved. Second. Moved by Board Member Anderson, second by Vice Chair Cooker. Uh, any discussion? Hearing, seeing none, call for your vote. By your action, you have approved this item 7 0. Now we'll move on to the discussion agenda. Resolution of the school board to ask voters whether they approve an additional one mil in ad valorem taxes to improve school operations. I'll ask Dr. Green to read the recommendation. 
that the Duval County School Board approve the attached resolution. All right, ask for a motion. So moved. Second. Second. Well, moved by, <laughs> moved by board member uh, Jones, second by board member Hershey. Any uh, discussion? We do have board member Joyce to place this item on discussion. We'll start with her and any other discussion. Board member Joyce. Yeah, thank you. Um, the reason why I pulled this for discussion tonight was because two weeks ago, uh, Dr. Green went in a workshop, presented this resolution to us. At that time, we were able to um, ask questions about the uh, presentation. We received those questions back in form of an email. Um, but in, the whole, in that whole time, I was my understanding that we would be discussing this tonight. And so by 3.30 this afternoon, I called the board office and said, what's the situation with this resolution? Is it on consent agenda? And the item was on consent agenda. So are we discussing the item or are we just going to pass the item? And I was told that I would have to take the item and pull it for discussion so that we could have a robust conversation around the resolution. Um, so that is why I pulled this item for discussion and I will yield and to see if anybody has any questions if not i can continue on no that's fair and i think there was some confusion i think some folks thought it was on public hearing so they thought we would be discussing anyway but i do appreciate you pulling because i think it is important for the community to hear from us if we do have uh thoughts or or want to have a conversation on it so i appreciate you pulling is there anyone who does want to speak to the item in addition to that board member hershey uh, th thank you through the through the chair i have a couple of questions if it's okay I'd move to dr green or i don't know um, you, you probably know these questions. I don't know if you want to call on uh, Ms. Bagley. But would you please explain um, categorical, categorical dollars and restrictions that are attached to those dollars? Through the chair to Board Member Hershey, um, the FEFP, and I, I, I just always know it by FEFP, the Florida Education, Education Finance Plan Program. Okay. There you go. Uh, is a very complicated, so I'll do my best to try to say it in layman's terms, but um, that finance program is what funds school districts. Uh, it is based on what we call full-time equivalent, FTE, that means students. Students, are they enrolled, and every student garners a certain amount of dollars, as well as through your local um, taxes, what I, Avalorum taxes, through your millage. Uh, it is divided into two sections. That's the first beginning, your capital funding, which can only be spent on capital uh, projects that meet the criteria of what capital is, and then your operational dollars. Your operational dollars can be divided in what we call categoricals. So class size reduction. Class size reduction can only be, it's a categorical. It can only be spent on um, hiring teachers for reducing the class size so that in grades pre-K to three, the class size average should be one to 18, grades four through eight, one to 22, high school, one to 25. Uh, other categoricals, transportation, um, there's a categorical for reading. So each categorical has a definition of what you can spend those dollars for. So even though our total budget may be 2.1 billion, there's a portion that's for capital that can only be utilized for maintenance and uh, basically brick and mortar facilities, trans uh, vehicles. And then operations is used for salaries as well as benefits, health insurance. Uh, so health insurance for all, all of our employees, the board pays a portion of that health insurance uh, as well as the salaries of our 13,000 employees. Uh, other categoricals uh, include um, uh, supplemental funding, funding for students who are struggling. We have a requirement to spend those dollars. It, it, again, every categorical has a definition and it tells us these are the things you can spend dollars, uh, those dollars related to those topics. Um, but much of what we receive, we are somewhat told these are the areas you can spend it. The one category is discretionary dollars. Those are the dollars that whatever wasn't touched in these categories is how we fund everything else. So when we talked about 
the arts or athletics, much of those discretionary dollars for the most part are going to many other things than the arts or athletics. Many schools have to rely on their PTAs to help foster whatever's missing um, in their athletic program or, you know, playgrounds. We, we might replace the playground once every other year. Um, and PT, those that have newer, their PTA is the one who's been raising the money to go out and fundraise to replace that playground. But again, um, our funding comes in categor categoricals and then discretionary and much of your discretionary is generally used to pay for salaries. So if there is anything that um, Ms. Bagley you felt I left out, I will gladly now turn it over to you. She didn't think of it. She gave you the thumbs up. Through the, through the chair, that was obviously an informative question. <laughs> um, I believe that many of us on the board understand that, but funding for education is rather complicated uh, and it works a little differently for us than even uh, City Hall in the way that we can spend dollars. And I think that that's important to understand. And so Dr. Green, I appreciate you explaining that. Uh, through the chair, I, I do have just another question for, for Dr. Green. I know that you stated it in your report earlier um, about the fact that uh, up until around 2010, the millage rate was not rolled back. And because we've had a deficit in dollars uh, over the past decade, uh, could you remind us of how many dollars have been uh, lost or not been directed to the district because of the ro rollback over the past decade? 657.6 million. And I ask that question because what happens when we roll back the millage is that it's kind of like having a glass full of water, right? And you roll back and so you kind of bring it, it's half full now. And then you've rolled it back and you just fill it up again. It never gets to overflowing. So if you just left it level, for example, if it was where it was in 2010 and it hadn't changed, growth would pay for itself, right? Because it's level and you're building upon it. But when you're rolling it back, you're not building upon it. Um, and so um, that's part of the reason for this conversation. And uh, I won't take more time except to say uh, that this vote tonight uh, does not raise anybody's taxes. What it does do is it um, allows us to ask City Hall, the City Council, to put it on the ballot for the voters to decide. And I believe that our community deserves a chance to answer that question. Thank you, Board Member Hershey. Uh, other comments? Board Member Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I couldn't have said it better than my colleague, uh, Ms. Hershey. I, um, I don't call it a, a millage increase. I'd rather call it a partial millage restoration. Mm -hmm. A partial millage restoration. Because what has happened is that for the last 10 years, the Department of Education has required that we roll back our millage. Even if, even if, the, have, if the one mil increase does pass, and hopefully it will, we taxpayers in Duval County will still be paying less than they would have been, they paid in 2015. Just seven years ago, they were paying, they would still be paying less. So I call it a partial millage restoration, not a millage increase. Um, I grew up here, uh, the city of Jacksonville, since my good friend John Elaney became mayor, has always rolled back the millage. They are everybody who ran for mayor, no new taxes. That, that's how you got elected. John Delaney did it, but you had a very strong, robust economy. And even though he rolled back the millage a very small amount, he still was able to pick up 50 to $80 million in new tax revenue because the, the city was growing, uh, property value increasing. Along comes John Payton. He says no new taxes also, and he finds, hey, I can't balance this budget and provide the services for our community without increasing taxes or coming up with what he called a fee increase. And I apologize to Mayor Payton later on because I can't imagine where the city of Jacksonville would be 
had this, had he not pushed for a, a stormwater fee, a garbage fee, and a franchise fee, because that's how he had to do it. You can't run the city on the cheap, and that's what we've done. Then you had another mayor to come along and say, well, no new taxes and no new fees. And what happened? We laid off 140 police officers, and then the city council said, enough is enough. We're going to raise the millage one mill. Not one complaint, one, not one person complained because we were not going to allow this city to lay off 240 additional police officers in 2012, 2013 when that happened. So we have run our education system on the cheap for decades, for decades. Our facilities are in, were in disrepair and now we passed a half penny to address that. Now we of addressing the need of our teachers and our employees, make sure that they are compensated properly like other counties are doing throughout the state of Florida. It's not because we want to, it's because we have to. If we put students first, we need to make sure that every student in Duval County is being taught by a teacher that's certificated. We don't need subs in our classrooms. And those of us who represent schools that are in the turnaround, that are struggling, those are the ones who need it the most. How can we ever reduce the achievement gap in Duval County if we don't ensure that every student has the right to have a certi certificated, highly effective or effective teacher standing in front of him or her? We have to do this. Uh, and we're not raising the tax. We're just asking the voters to approve this partial millage restoration so that we can provide our educators that impact our students each and every day what they need to be good, productive citizens in the future. So thank you. Thank you, Board Member Jones. Partial restoration. Pa okay. Partial millage restoration. Okay. Excellent. Um, other comments, thoughts? Uh, Board Member Pearson. Thank you. So uh, through the chair to Dr. Green. Thank you. Um, in the year that I've been on the board, I've, I've learned a lot <laughs> um, about school board budgeting, which I have found is quite different from personal budgeting. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's a joke with some of the other board members how I like a good bargain and will um, <laughs> and ferociously seek them out. <laughs> um, and so, but I have learned that school board budgeting is different from personal uh, family budgeting. The other thing I've learned about is um, something called the required local effort. And I would love for, um, through the chair, for Dr. Green to explain what the required local effort is, um, what that, how it's calculated, what the relationship is with the state budget that we get from the state legislature, and then um, also when it comes to the required local effort, do more homeowners, because one of our speakers mentioned growth, that Jacksonville's booming, do more homeowners mean more revenue? Through the chair to board member Pearson, required local effort is set by the state of Florida. So the Department of Education and the Department of Revenue determines what is our required local effort. And the slide that I showed that in 2010 it was five point something and now it's at 3.5, that is the required local effort. And what the Department of Education or Department of Revenue, they've been doing what they call a rollback. They keep lowering it because the property tax, as the property taxes increase, which means you are either adding more property owners or their value is starting to increase, they roll it back so that in reality, they're not paying more taxes, which in turn, we get less money. So that's why this, the, the number 657 million, if the millage had just stayed flat at five point, um, five point whatever the, the other numbers, the values would have changed, which would have meant we would have been getting increases. But what they are currently doing is that they don't want to raise the, the taxes, so they roll it back on required local effort. And that is how we are different than local government um, because they control their own required local effort. We do not. And then I have a follow-up. And then again, I'm, I'm learning this, so if this is an untrue statement, please correct me. But 
I think it's true. The way that I understand it is that um, there is a budget number that the state comes up with through the FTE and other calculations, and then there's the um, amount of taxes that we collect through the required local effort, and that does that tax money does not go on top of or in addition to the state money from the state. It's actually deducted from or backed out of the money that we get from the state. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Through the chair to board member Pearson, you are correct. That is how the FEFP keeps fairness. So if you're in a school district that your tax, you don't generate nearly the amount of local effort, then you get more state effort. If you generate more local effort, then you get less state so that it balances that large urban school district like Duval is not um, funded differently than a little county like Jefferson and that, that, they're, that we're comparable uh, in funding. So yes, it is adjusted based on your local property taxes and then what the state calculates. So it comes together. So then no matter how much we collect, we really don't gain because that just backs out of what's given to us. Through the chair to board member Pearson, Basically, yes, it, it, again, it adjusts every year and um, the goal is that it, it doesn't matter where you live in the state of Florida that the funding for your school district should not be much different and your, your local effort doesn't put you at a disadvantage. And I'm sorry, one last no, question. You're good, you're good. So with regard to the required local effort and the proposed one mill, would that one mill be on top of the funding that we're getting, like in addition to the funding that we're getting, or would that one mill also be backed out so it would be a zero sum issue? Through the chair to board member Pearson, because it is local, it is in addition. Board Member Pearson. Other thoughts or questions? Board Member Joyce. Thank you. Through the chair to Dr. Green. Um, my background is education. I was, a t I, was, I was a teacher in the district before I was elected to the school board. Um, and one of the things that I was always concerned about was teacher pay and our paraprofessional pay. And my mom was a paraprofessional. She lived off that salary, which was really nothing. Um, when we, a couple of months ago, when you brought to the board the increase to bring everybody in the district up to $15 an hour, I said, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, uh, because they deserve that. But my concern was, why had we not done it before? Why, why now do we have the financial means to do it when we didn't have the financial means to do it before. And I think your answer was something along the line of, this is maybe probably not sustainable, but could you, do you re recall that question and can mm -hmm. you kind of help okay. me understand this? Through the chair to board member Joyce, probably in the back of my mind, probably before I wasn't your superintendent, but since being your superintendent since 2018, we have worked incredibly hard, finance department. I believe the board at that time put in some checks and balances, and we even came back and added some additional checks and balances to truly make sure that we are keeping in line with policy of a 5% fund balance. When I arrived, I believe our fund balance was somewhere hovering around three. Today, it just in unassigned is over 5%. Um, when you add assigned, it, it gets up to 6.5%. So one, we have been good stewards of the taxpayer dollars. Two, uh, I believe in the past you, you were paying so low, it would have been incredibly difficult to jump from $8 to 15. I believe when we recommended 10 or $11 maybe, was the beginning, so about $4. We felt we weren't going, we were going to just bleed out with paraprofessionals. Currently we have close to 400 vacancies today and that the state passed a law that 
by 2026, you were going to have to be at $15 an hour anyway. We felt we were that the vacancies that were created that we could actually afford, we could go to $15. And even though we're at $15, you saw the slide, we're still, we're keeping, we're retaining most of our paras, but we are not able to hire new and, and I didn't even know about the target thing, so now we'll, we'll just, really just. be up against that. But that, in the past, that was so far down, that's why they could not move to, they weren't going to be able to sustain it that far back, even the fund balance was not above 5%. But today we, we are paying peers at $15 an hour, but we're, we're also not really hiring new parents because they're, they're just not accepting it. Okay. Um, so the ability for us to pay the additional salary to the employees, was, is any of that attached to the ESSER funding that we're receiving? We've received, I think, ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and maybe projected to receive ESSER 3, which I believe, I'm not sure, is $500 million or something, but is any of those salaries attached to the ESSER funding? Through the chair to board member Joyce, no, there are no salary increases tied to ESSER. However, through ESSER, we are allowed, uh, the gentleman mentioned about the teachers got $1,000, which for classroom teachers, that was from the governor. Through the action of this board, through ESSER, we were able to give the other certificated individuals who were not identified as classroom teachers as a $1,000 bonus. For all the other bargaining units, we were able to give $750 supplement, but that is through ESSER because it goes away. We no permanent salary can be tied to ESSER, have any we, of the ESSER. So through the chair to Dr. Green, have we used any of the, in our discretionary pot that we would normally run our school district on, have we allocated ESSER funding for things that we would have used for out of the discretionary fund? Through the chair to board member Joyce, that is a yes and no answer. Yes, because if we didn't have ESSER, we would have to use discretionary funding to purchase it. No, in that you can, you have to also maintain what they call maintenance of equity and maintenance of effort. So we can't supplant what you would have been purchasing with your discretionary dollars. So let me give you an example. Um, ES, we couldn't decide, oh, we'll use our ESSER dollars to pay for all our ESE teachers. Well, you, that was something you should be doing with your discretionary dollars uh, outside of your ESE categorical. That's another categorical guaranteed dollars. So that's what I mean by yes, you can. So for PPE, before ESSER even came along, that's what we were using to purchase cleaning supplies, um, antimicrobial things. We were using our discretionary dollars. But when ESSER came and said, oh no, you can reimburse. So now when we utilize those dollars, we reimburse ourselves through ESSER. But we I, are. I'm, I'm hoping I'm answering your question. But we are using just ESSER funding for things that we, if we had no ESSER funding, we would have been using out of the discretionary fund. We would paying for these things out of the discretionary fund. Through the chair to board member Joyce, that again is a yes, we probably wouldn't have purchased it. So today, yes, we're purchasing supplemental curriculum uh, in the past when we didn't have it, we just didn't buy it because we didn't have the dollars. So yes, if we had the dollars, we would have used our discretionary dollars to purchase it. Um, the requirement under ESSER is 20% of it must be for student uh, related, what they call student loss, so summer school. In the past, we would have used our discretionary dollars to pay for summer school. Well now, because we're required to use this ESSER funding for things like that, we're using that for summer school. But that will go away we have this summer and next summer, and I believe it will go away after next summer, those dollars that we would 
could so use. So I will just say my concern is the long term. Um, when we look down the road and we look at the long term, what does this, ha what happens in four years? What happens when all the ESSER funding goes away? Um, when are we going to be able to sustain this salary for our parents and for our teachers and for, you know, all of the employees in our district? So financially, this is a concern for me um, because I don't want us to get where we're, we've inflated something and then we get to this point, which being a teacher in the system, there's been a time where, well, we don't have the money to do this stuff anymore, so cut, 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 and then everybody's mad at the school board, and this is where we get to, we can't manage a budget, or would they, that's a perception from the public, is that we cannot do that. Um, and so, this is a piece in my uh, calculation as to how I'm gonna vote tonight, is the sustainability, what happens in the long run, are we passing the buck on to another board in the future? Um, as far as teaching, I'm, I'm hearing um, that, that teacher pay is the reason why uh, we have teachers leaving the district. And when I looked at this quarter, this year's separations, I think it said we had 300 and 70, 358 teachers that separated and eight of them left because of teacher pay. They cited that as a reason. And I'm only gonna say that to say, I've, I've worked in the system and I understand the struggles that teachers have. And now after the pandemic, they're more severe than ever before. Teachers are ex depressed, they have anxiety, when you go into school, you're on all day long. You don't get a you don't get a planning period most of the time. You're required to do your lesson plans. You're required to do your small groups. You're required to go to your professional development trainings. You're required, you're required, you're required, you're required. And it just it falls on the teacher. And this is why they're burnt out. And this is why they are stressed out. And it's not a problem in just Duval County. This is a problem across the state, and this is a problem across the nation. And I just want to encourage this board to be trailblazers and to say, you know what, maybe it's not the teachers need or they want $5,000 more. Why don't we make life easier for them? Why don't we implement things in our school system that can support teachers. I, I just read the other day where Texas is giving their teachers an extra planning period. I mean, there are things that we can talk about as a board that's innovative, but I think throwing money on top of a pro that's not actually going to get to the root of this problem. And so I just, as my experience and why I'm sitting in this chair, I just want to bring that to the board. Um, that's my perception. Um, so at the end of the day, um, I value teachers, and I think that we need to pay our teachers. We've gone from $39,000 for a beginning teacher to $47,000, and we are still losing teachers the first five years. They're walking away in droves. So that's a symptom. But I also think that you do need to pay your, your veteran teachers more. And I'm going to ask, I know we do audits regularly, and I know that um, there's specific reasons why we do audits, but I think that what we need to do as a board is look at an inference, um, a forensic audit that go back through for the taxpayer's benefit, to go back through and to look for cheating, waste, mismanagement, fraud. It may not be there. I'm not saying that it's there, but I'm saying that if we do something like this, this is kind of different than the, the than a, than a, you know, a different kind of audit, we're just looking at financials. If you struggle and you really focus down on, is there um, mismanagement? You know, are we duplicating things? Uh, we need to do that kind of, we need to have that kind of effort, in my opinion, before we go to the taxpayer and ask them for, for more money. So at the end of the day, I, I think if we do that, we can pay our veteran teachers more. We can find Funding, I would say, now maybe not, but I think we at least should give it a try before we get to bringing it, the referendum to the taxpayers. 
good. Thank you. Board member, Dr. Coker. Um, through the chair um, to Dr. Green, um, uh, 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 my, my colleague to the left here does mention something that I'd like to double check on. Um, we know that this is potentially asking the voters to consider um, millage increase. Remind me of how many years we're talking about for this. Through the chair, it's for four years. And, and it and has to go back before the voters, excuse me, back before the voters every four years. Okay, thank you. So it's a commitment of only four years, correct? Correct. Um, that being said, um, as a former teacher also, and principal and district um, leader and such, um, uh, talk to me. I know we've mentioned the word supplement and salary schedule. I do agree that we've got to be careful about obligating the district to four years from now if the voters it, say we don't take it back to the voters, say, you know, we, we don't know what's happening then. Um, that being said, how is this being designed in terms of uh, a teacher supplement versus putting it in the salary schedule? Through the chair to board member uh, Vice Chair Coker, a supplement is, is still has to be negotiated, but it, it is not guaranteed. So if there is no more funding for that specific supplement, then you can't offer that supplement anymore. Um, permanent inside the salary schedule, that is something that, although anything can be negotiated, but it, it would be rare if it changed to the negative, but that is something that the board would be committed that unless some unforeseen disaster, this is a person's salary that they're going to make. Thank you. Um, that being said, it's been my experience, um, having been a building level principal, often gave people supplements and, and they used it maybe to pay for a little vacation or a down payment on a car, a down payment on a house, but they knew it was for one year. So we are still talking about that same type of supplement. Through the chair to Vice Chair Coker, again, if this happens, it, everything does have to be negotiated, but that would be the um, thinking, the philosophy, that it should be a supplement because mm -hmm. If it's no longer available, then there's nothing to negotiate. There's nothing to have a conversation about. Okay, thank you. And then um, I, I, I will say that because of um, my, my colleague to the left, we do have an auditing committee that's coming on board. We voted on it last year, um, and we're bringing that online, which I do think is great in adding transparency. Um, that being said, we are audited routinely as a district by the state. Is that correct? To the chair, to vice chair, uh, Coker, yes, and we're being audited this year. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit about how these audits have come out in, in recent years? Uh, well, through the chair, to vice chair, uh, Coker, we just received our last FTE audit, and it was, it is, not was, it is probably the best audit the district has ever had in the history of them being audited for FTE. I believe it was only for $64,000. Um, that's in a $2.1 billion budget. Yes. Okay. Um, transportation, we've not, we haven't received the information about transportation yet, so we're, we're not 100% clear about that, but mm -hmm. we are scheduled to have an AG audit which will look at financial, they will do a complete financial audit this year, as well as federal, our federal funding that we receive, they will be auditing that. So the AG, that is the state organization, will be living in the district uh, starting about, is it March 28th or May 28th? Thursday? Oh, gosh. They'll be here quicker than all coming together okay, for they'll you, be here Thursday. Here it is. And we'll stay in the district until we go through a complete audit. Right. And they will do much of what uh, Board Member Joyce is saying. Are you the, are you doing things that would be considered wasteful? They always do a fraud audit um, as part of, of their work. Okay, thank you. And just for the record, um, because everyone else is talking about the second job they had as a first year teacher, I want to go on record as saying mine was I ran summer camps for middle school students. So just as an FYI, I had a second gig as a beginning teacher myself here in Duval County. Nice. Uh, board member Anderson, and then we'll go back to board member Joyce. Thank you. I was, I was reminiscing, I started teaching in Alachua County mm. at 28,000. Oh wait, I was I at was, 19. That was a, um, 
Those were, those were tough times. I can beat you both with recreation. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple of questions um, that, that I'd like to start with. Um, I, I want to kind of go back to why you are recommending a millage increase versus any other option. Why a millage increase? So you're the chair to uh, board chair Anderson. First and foremost, just like we have categoricals, if, if a school district is going to go for a referendum, they also have rules. The half cent sales tax can only be used for capital. It cannot be used for operations or salaries. Uh, so that particular tax, we could not say, well, why didn't you do that with those? No, you can't. Um, the other referendum school districts are allowed to take advantage of is a, is a millage. And a millage can um, be used for a number of things that fall under operations. So that is why we chose this particular um, item. Number two, one would ask, well, if you have a robust fund balance, why wouldn't you just uh, utilize those dollars. Well, the board has a policy that the goal is to try to always maintain a 5% fund balance. Uh, fund balance is like your uh, savings account. If you don't keep putting dollars in it, if you start spending it, then you don't, you're, you're reducing your fund balance. And your fund balance is there designed to take care of emergencies, unforeseen, or poor budget years where you need to go into your fund balance to help beef up your uh, budget. Uh, and so that's why I wouldn't recommend, oh, well, that first year you actually have enough money to, to do what this referendum would do, but you do not have enough money to maintain that for four years. Um, the third reason, people may say, well, why don't you go through and cut and reduce? Um, we, four years ago, I believe, some members of this board was involved in cut, 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 cut this, cut music, cut art. And the board made sort of a, a stand, a line in the sand and said, no, we're not going to do this continuing cut, cut, cut. So they put the onus on finance and then I came in to really put in measures, checks and balances to prevent us from getting in that situation again. Um, we have not had uh, like robust budget years, but what we've done is maintain to those principles and that things that we, you know, I'm not sure we're at the point where we have, oh, these are my wants and we can fund them. ESSER does give us now the opportunity for the things that are wants, like the supplemental curriculum that we never buy, now we can, because you want to invest in things that you will have when the money's gone. You don't want to invest in salaries because that continues, and one, there's a rule that you can't. So you can only use it for bonuses or, um, I, I'm not even sure you can use it for supplements, but you can only use it for bonuses um, at this time. So the district's finances are in a strong position, but they're not in a position that you could uh, find $82 million every year to take out and say that we're going to just address this to uh, compensation and uh, arts and athletics. Um, thank you. I, I'm wondering, Mr. Poole, if you can shed any more light on these um, laws or restrictions that school boards or school districts have and how they can seek revenue from a community. What is the um, statute on that? Uh, through the chair to board member Anderson, the statute that, first of all, dealing with the sales surtax, uh, that's governed by section 212.055, subparagraph 6C. Um, and that's dealing strictly by, by statute. Uh, you can use the surtax proceeds, quote, for fixed capital expenditures or fixed capital costs associated with construction or reconstruction uh, or improvement of school facilities and so forth. So that's got to be dedicated, if you will, or, or earmarked for that. The millage increase that we're dealing with here is 
set forth in section 1011.732. Uh, and, and I'll just quote from the statute. It says, the district school board, pursuant to resolution adopted at a regular meeting, shall direct the county commissioners to call an election at which the electors within the school district may approve an ad valorem tax millage as authorized under section 1011.719. And then if you look over at 1011.71, subparagraph 9, it states in pertinent part, it says, quote, a school district may levy by local referendum or in general election additional millage for school operational purposes. And then it goes on to say that the money collected uh, for school operational purposes includes charter schools sponsored by a school district. So what, what we've had is the, the sales tax would be for, for capital uh, expenditures, whereas this would be for operational. Hopefully that answers the, the it, question of the dichotomy. It does, and I, and I hate to put you on the spot, but do you know if, this is, if these are the only means by which a school board or school district would be able to go back to um, a local community for increased revenue? To my knowledge, short of maybe somebody just pulling money out of their pocket, you know, to, to donate, I, I'm not aware of any other. Thank you, Mr. Means. Thank you, Mr. Poole. I appreciate that. Um, I know that there's been a lot of conversation about, you know, why a property tax or why not this or what's happening with the half penny. Um, and so my another question that I would have is. Um, can the half penny sales surtax be used for our arts or athletics programs? To the chair, to board member Anderson, if only if it is in the capital construction brick and that is the only, so equipment is not considered uh, under like music instruments or repairing a bleacher, even though you could for maintenance, we're allowed to use capital for the maintenance of a bleacher, but to buy bleachers, you still would use your operational dollars. So capital, if, if that's what your question was asking, really. Okay. So no, we couldn't replace the art. People think, well, can you build us an art room? No, because that's capital. That, that would not be a part of the millage. Would it be accurate to say that refurbishing an auditorium, seats, lighting, sound equipment could be, but band instruments would not be? The seating could be used with capital because it's part of that facility. The equipment really is still operational because I could still have a sound system in a pre-K classroom. It, 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 that that's not really part of capital equipment. And the referendum that we posed to the voter for the half cent sales tax was pretty prescriptive in what we would use it for. Is that through the chair to, to board member Anderson? Yes, that is why um, stated if you're building a brand new school, yes, a playground, we would put a playground with a brand new school. But that is not the case when um, if we are renovating uh, you know, uh, an elementary school that did not include your playground. It did not, that's not a part of the uh, master facilities plan. Thank you. Um, I have, we've heard a lot about the size of the budget <laughs> for this school district tonight. We talked about the categoricals and, and the way that the state has defined for us how we can use most, well, I won't say most, but a lot of that budget. Um, I'm wondering if, if you know or if Ms. Bagley knows um, what is the percent of the budget that goes towards salaries and benefits currently? Ms. Begley. Through to chair to um, board member Anderson, depending on the year, it could be anywhere from 65 to 70 percent of our budget. Okay. Thank you for that. I I think that's the end of my questions. Most of the questions I think have been asked. Um, and we've had really great conversations, so I appreciate that. But I'd love to Please. just kind of have a moment. 
<laughs> with the community. Um, this has been a really hard process for me to think about going back out and asking our community for more money. Um, because I know that like the people that came and spoke to us tonight, people are struggling. Um, it is hard to make ends meet financially for many, many people. Um, we've got rising costs for goods and services, inflation, um, and then we've seen recent taxes across the city. And certainly times are tough. Um, and I know that people still have a lot of questions, even though we're asking questions tonight, I know people want to know exactly how will this money be used. Um, people are going to want to know what's happening with the revenue from the sales surtax. Where are we at with that? They're going to want to know, um, you know, how have we been spending their money so far? What are we using the millage on um, that we've been getting? Hasn't property values been going up? And a lot of the conversation that we're having here tonight, people aren't listening to. Thank you for those of you who are listening out there. Um, but I know that the community at large will still have these questions. And so I think we have tried to be as transparent as possible. Um, but I know that w the community is going to need more answers. Um, they want to be informed about how their tax dollars are spent, as do I. Um, and I think that they have a right to. Um, and I know that we can't do all of that here tonight, but we do have the opportunity to provide information and engage the community in education, with education and information um, that is critically important for fiscal transparency. And I think that just the opportunity to have that conversation for people to say, what's going on? I want to dig in and find out how the FEFP works. Um, that's an interesting opportunity. I, I look forward to the possibility of a community workshop on the FEFP, if anybody out there is interested, maybe um, the Parent Academy wants to hop on that. Um, but with that said tonight, I think that it's important for us to keep in mind that the discussion we're having and our vote tonight is really, um, for me, about allowing our community to weigh in and have a voice. Um, unlike other governing bodies, um, the school board, as Mr. Poole has shared with us, really only has a couple of additional ways to bring revenue uh, to support the needs of our students, our staff, and our community. Um, and these both require a referendum um, to go to a vote of the people. Um, so I do want to make really clear that no matter what the results are here tonight, it will not result in an increase in anyone's taxes today. Um, but what it will do is allow our community to come together in the most democratic way, right? We will learn, we will make an informed decision together, and I have to support giving people a voice to exercise their liberty and freedom. Having a choice at the ballot box is important to me, um, and so tonight I do feel like um, I can confidently support this measure because I support giving the people in our community a voice through their vote. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Board Member Anderson. Board Member Joyce. But at the same time, we are the guardians of taxpayer dollars. And when we pass this on, we have to make sure that, that the community understands where their tax, taxpayer dollars are going and what the, the situation in the district is. And I will say that, um, number one, I know, Dr. Coger, you said we voted on an audit accountability or advisory committee last year. We didn't. We voted last month. And this committee is not stood up yet, and this committee has not done any work mm -hmm. for audit or anything. And my other concern was there are different kinds of audits. There are audits to verify your financial accuracy. There's audits for processes and systems. And what I'm asking for is an audit for the efficiency, to look for inefficiency, redundancy, and waste in the district. That's what I mean by when I want a forensic audit. And if we can get that and we can convince the taxpayers, this is, there's the, it's legit. And we have the audit advisory committee, then I'm more comfortable going to the taxpayer. But I see myself as a guardian to make sure that what we pass along, they can have confidence in that. Thank you, Board Member Joyce. Other other thoughts, comments from Dr. Cooker? Um, 
uh, through the chair, and I, uh, Board Member Anderson touched on something, um, and Board Member Joyce, you're right about the transparency piece. That being said, and I apologize if I misspoke, we started the conversation last year, passed it last month. So um, that being said, um, through the chair to Dr. Green, I do believe this is an opportunity to always highlight a practice that's going on with the half penny. Can you speak to, because I refer people to it all the time, and they think it is um, one of the best things we've done in terms of transparency with how we use taxpayer dollars. Can you speak to the dashboard um, and any thoughts on if this, if this were to go to the voters and if it were to happen, would there be something similar, similar or comparable? Through the chair to Vice Chair Coker, um, currently we have a, a dashboard on the website that shows our revenue that comes in from the half cent sales tax. Uh, we show the, the amount that is budgeted in the district. We show all the projects for the next 15 years, the budget, what's been expended, when projects are scheduled to start, and where that funding comes from, where it, excuse me, where is the funding going once we receive it, and what projects is it attached to. Uh, we meet with the oversight committee uh, every other month. The oversight committee, they all have, well, the general public has access to the dashboard, but um, the oversight committee does their homework. They make sure they check the dashboard and know everything about the dashboard before we meet. Um, they've been very diligent, even in, oh, there, there's the dashboard. There's the dashboard. <laughs> um, you, you can see information by each school board member, by, uh, by school. So the dashboard's very uh, inclusive and very detailed, and they can see where their tax dollars are going as it relates to the sales tax. Um, I'm sure we will create something very similar if this is successful. I believe it is in the resolution about the, the audit committee being sort of the eyes uh, for the board over if this, is, if this resolution moves forward and the referendum is successful. Through the chair, thank you to Dr. Green. Like I said, I, I thought this was another opportunity to make sure the public is aware of that dashboard because every time I have referred someone to it, they're appreciative that we have it out there in such a transparent manner. Thank you. Love that. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for the robust dialogue. I, I, I'll just say there's never a, a good time, but this is the right time, the right time to honor our teachers. Uh, as we said before, the, the state came with uh, raising new and novice teacher salaries, but we have to honor our veteran, our experienced teachers uh, with this. We have to give our staff a, a competitive advantage. If you think about us compared to the Big Seven, and to think that students who are graduating or folks aren't making decisions about where they're going based on salary is something that we have to think about. To think about our HR department who goes to recruiting fairs and, and says, hey, do you want to come here versus these other places? This is going to give them that tool. And I think it's a both and. Uh, I've seen our, 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 our staff really get behind the efforts of recruitment and retention. And now this gives us another opportunity to really uh, do that out in the community. So we, we're here tonight to vote, but I also want to hear um, about what is next. I wanna hear uh, from our attorney about if this does go, what are, what are the steps in this um, as we move to the next part of this, if this does go through tonight or if it doesn't, what are the next steps so the community does know? Uh, yes, to the chair, and I believe that Dr. Green's presentation also had a slide that pre presented sort of a step-by-step. -step. My first step tomorrow morning would be to make sure this is formatted and sent across the river to City Hall. I don't have the, the deadlines no, memorized, but then ultimately, the, you know, the, the city council would need to uh, approve it to be put on uh, the uh, ballot. And I, oh yes, we have it here. Um, so tomorrow morning, bright and early, I get to work on uh, getting this formatted for city council, and then the remaining. So I, I really want to, if this passes tonight, I really want to get this done prior to March 16th and as quickly as possible in the event that there's any delay with city council, so it gives them more time. And then the remaining dates we've got outlined on the, on the slide here. 
No, I appreciate that. I just wanted to reiterate for the community, and it's twofold. It's There is a process that's involved, but also our step here is actually giving the community an opportunity to vote. That is what we're doing today. We're giving the community an opportunity to weigh in um, after us sort of consuming the information from our, our folks. Board Member Anderson. Um, Mr. Poole, would the, does the City Council have discretion about whether or not to place this on the ballot? I will read the statute. Um, <laughs> Where angels fear to tread. Um, and it reads, and I quote, the district school board pursuant to resolution adopted at a regular meeting shall direct uh, the county commissioners to call an election. Um, so the, uh, we've asked for, we, we have not received any written opinion, but uh, I don't anticipate there being any problem on that issue. Thank you for that. Thank you for that question. Board Member Hershey. J just to follow up um, through the chair, Mr. Poole, isn't there existing litigation that uh, supports that statute? I, I believe there is. If I remember correctly, out of Indian River, uh, there's a circuit court decision indicating that uh, the county commission did not have discretion to refuse uh, to do that. So I, I believe that's uh, through the chair, I apologize, um, that uh, has decided this. And that in that decision, although not binding in circuit court in Duval County, would certainly be persuasive uh, with, uh, with a court. May avoid Chalamet. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Any other final thoughts or, or comments as we wrap up this discussion? All right, seeing no further comments or discussion, I will call for your vote. By your actions, you have passed this item 6-1. Thank you. We'll now move on to the next item, which is a public hearing and vote revisions to Chapter 2, eight, um, Chapter 8 Board Policy. That the Duval County School Board conduct a public hearing and adopt the recommendation revisions to the following policies in School Board Manual Chapter 8. Policy 8.75, assignment on portable electronic equipment. Dr. Green, I think I read your part. Can you read it again there? <laughs> <laughs> read your recommendation. Uh, that the Duval County School Board conduct a public hearing and adopt the recommended revisions to the following policies in School Board Manual Chapter 8. Policy 8.75, Assignment of Portable Electronic Equipment. just want to make sure everybody heard it twice. Uh, <laughs> open the public hearing. Is there anyone who wishes to speak to this item? Seeing none, close the public hearing. Ask for a motion. So moved. Second. Second. Moved by Board Member Anderson, second by Board Member Jones. Um, are there any members wishing to speak to this item? All right, call for your vote. Fire action, you have approved this item 7 0. Now, moving on to board member travel, that the Duval County School Board approve and confirm the travel listed below for official business of the district and that it complies with the rules of the State Board of Education. March 18th to 22nd, 2022, Washington, D.C., Council of Great City Schools, 2022 Annual Legislative Policy Conference, Anderson. Uh, is there anyone who wishes to speak? All right, hearing none, seeing none, ask for your vote, ask for your motion. So moved. Moved by Board Member Anderson, second by uh, Vice Chair Coker. Anyone wishing to speak? Call for your vote. Fire action, you have approved this item 7-0. Uh, there is no superintendent travel 
on the agenda for tonight. And now we'll move on to For the Record, and we'll start with Board Member Jones. Okay, thank you, sir. I have a note here. Uh, you mentioned uh, Coach Day, and uh, I just want to offer my condolences to the, the Day family. I've known him since the since the late '80s, and outstanding educator, teacher, mentor to a lot of people in this community. So. My condolences go to him and the entire Reigns family because the Reigns family has had a, taken a big hit the last month. First with Coach Jimmy Day, I mean uh, Jimmy Johnson, followed by uh, Sally Daniels, who was a longtime educator, coach, counselor, followed by uh, the first NFL football player to graduate from Reigns in. Uh, Ken Burroughs, number double zero, who died uh, uh, a little before Coach Day, and then, of course, Coach Day passed. So I know that community is hurting because they've lost uh, a lot of great individuals who contributed a lot to their success over the years. Um, and secondly, um, I want to thank Harold Craw and the Jumbo Shrimp Organization for the hosting the annual heritage game that Reebok finally won. They beat us, and, and Daryl didn't bet me. <laughs> You're gonna wait the football season, I guess, and get me back. <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm sure that the young men who participated in that game really enjoyed it. They had their throwback uniforms, and I think that's always exciting. And lastly, uh, congratulations to the culinary staff at Frank H. Peterson on winning the culinary cook-off that was sponsored by the TPC. Uh, I mean, it was some great competition. I know the judges had a tough job trying to decide who would win. Uh, I got there a little late, but they were still excited, and the uh, team that won also was given a $1,500 scholarship each uh, to each one of the students from uh, FSCJ Foundation. I uh, want to thank them for their participation. But it was a great event. Uh, I'm sure after they received their uh, passes to the TPC on Sunday for the championship, that more teams will be participating and parents will make sure that their kids are participating. So if they win, they will get that one day pass to the TPC. And they also got a wonderful jacket. So it was a wonderful event. Uh, very proud of the work that we're doing in teaching our students. And uh, uh, Frank H. Peterson just stood out this time, but there were some great teams there from Sandalwood and other schools. Can't think of all four, but it was, it was some good competition. And the judges had a tough job, and, and uh, they really enjoyed what happened. Thank you very much. Thank you, Board Member Jones. And they're cooking on their home turf, so that helped out. <laughs> their own we'll pots take and pans. We'll <laughs> take <it. laughs> Board Member Joyce. <laughs> I have nothing tonight. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Coker? Um, sure. Um, like Board Member Jones, I also just want to extend my condolences to Coach Day's family. Um, as a former middle school principal, I have attended a number of the Bob Hayes Invitationals, and he knew every principal's name and was quick to come up and give you a hug and smile and make sure you had gotten the right concessions. There were always certain concessions that he advocated for. Um, but he made you feel like family, and he made your kids feel like family. And I know I'm, I'm looking at some other principals in the room that are shaking their heads because they had the same experience as I did. Um, and his uh, daughters are incredible people, um, one of whom I was blessed to work with as well. Um, so my condolences to them. Um, I do want to thank the schools in District 1 that included me um, in their mid-year stakeholders reports. I didn't get to every single one, but I got to a number of them. I just, Dr. Green, I continue to be amazed at the incredible work that these principals do and the teachers and the plans and also um, kept hearing about region soups and chief of school and support they're here feeling and whatnot. And it's just so good to, to hear all of that. Um, I'm amazed at, at what they're doing each and every day. Um, I do want to give a special shout out to Chairperson Tooks at Fort Caroline Middle School who probably had none of the most robust 
school uh, mid-year stakeholder reports I've ever heard, and that includes during my time with the district and as a board member, so that's saying a lot. Um, just grappling with the issues in Arlington and having meaty conversation about what we need to do to make sure our children in Arlington stay on the right direction. So thank you to him. Um, I want to say thank you to Cell and Dr. T at River City Science Academy. Uh, they were kind enough to include me in their ninth annual STEM and Health Day. And I went on a Saturday thinking this would just be some small little STEM event, a couple hundred kids. Folks, there were thousands of people there. I have not seen anything like that in our community in a long time. Um, and, the, and to the community partners who all participated, thank you to all of them. Um, and again, I just applaud River City for putting the event on, for opening it up to the community. Um, it was a great day. I, I, and I got to take a picture with Star Wars characters as well, which was a bonus. So there you go. Um, I want to thank Ms. Spry uh, at Jacksonville Classical East for including me in the recent launch of that school um, in Arlington. We are struggling. It's fragile. And um, I appreciate her including me in the work that she intends to do with the children in Arlington. Um, finally, I, and I think Rachel's still here, Ms. Tutwiler Fortune, it just struck me um, as I was sitting here, I wanted to make sure I said thank you for the joint JPEF um, and DCS school board meeting the other night. But really, in reality, I just want to say thank you to you and all of your team. You know, I, we, we value every one of them. Um, your partnership is at a higher level than I think I've ever seen. It seems like every time there's an initiative, um, JPEF is right there alongside of us and not just helping with initiatives, but doing research to make sure that we're on the right track and doing it the right way. Um, uh, you know, the 1000 by 2025 initiative and, and other things. Just thank you for your leadership on the educational landscape and thank you for your partnership in this work. We are grateful. Um, and with that, I, I'm done. So thank, thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Board Member Anderson. Thank you. All right. Um, first, of course, I have to say congratulations to my lady senators. Um, the Fletcher girls soccer team are state champions. Ooh. The first ever soccer state champions, boys or girls, for Duval County. Um, so huge shout out to them. Congratulations. I'm sure that we will get the whole team here in an upcoming meeting to congratulate them. I'm looking for. Yes, <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you for that. Um, we um, are so proud of them. So congratulations to those, um, to that team. They were so sweet. They had like a whole pep rally thing and the, when they were leaving on the bus all the students were out cheering them on and there were signs and I mean it was a very exciting time. Um, I was able to wrap up school visits and getting to all of my schools in District 2. Um, it had been a long time since I had really been able to sit down with them in their buildings um, and just kind of talk about what was going on and, and their needs and um, their perseverance and their grit and the resilience that they have shown um, this year in particular. Um, and I thank them all for inviting me in and for the hard work that they're doing every day for our kids. Um, I also want to say congratulations to Ms. Francine Collette Ellabox, paraprofessional from Kernan Trail Elementary, and Sharon Johnson, the office clerk at Alamakani Elementary, who have both been nominated as finalists for the um, staff of the year, the em employee of the year. Um, and so I'm excited to help recognize them um, and wish them good luck as we work toward um, making a final announcement on employee of the year. Um, and lastly, look, this has been a hard weekend. <laughs> There's just been a lot going on in the world um, as Chairman Willie um, spoke about and I just want to leave with some words of wisdom for, oh, happy Women's Month. Um, and it's March, March 1st. Um, so wise words from Louisa May Alcott. Um, I am not afraid of storms, for I am learning to sail my ship. And so as we go through these challenging times as a district, as individuals, get better at sailing. I like that. Board Member Pearson. So mine's going to be long, and I know that we're late, but um, I sent an email out to my 22, the principals of my 22 schools and asked them for brags, and I got two pages worth of brags, and I think good news is worth sharing. So I will try to go through these fairly quickly, but 
Um, again, congratulations to congratulations to Charlotte Cackham from Wolfson and Dorothy Kokabani um, from Sandalwood as Sunshine State Scholars, and also to Aria Brown and Matthew Heider from Wolfson for being selected for the Florida Senate Page Program. Congratulations to the Douglas Anderson Wind Symphony um, and their director, Ted Schistel. They were invited to play at um, a festival at Georgia Southern and also at a conference in, at University of South Carolina with glowing comments um, from both places. Congratulations to Inglewood High School wrestler Deshaun Hires, who is qualified for the state competition and also for their girls competitive cheer team that's uh, qualified for the state competition. Congratulations to the Landon girls basketball team, Southern Division champs, and the Landon girls soccer team, Southern Division champs, and playing tomorrow night for the city championship against Fletcher Middle School. Congratulations <laughs> also to um, the Wolfson girls soccer program for making it to the regional semifinal. It's the farthest the girls soccer program at that school has ever made it. Um, in competition. But I also want to go out of District 3 a little and congratulate Providence. Um, they made it one game from the state final, their girls soccer team. Creekside, state champs. Mm -hmm. St. John's Country Day, state champs. Fletcher, state champs. Y'all, the state of girls soccer in Northeast Florida is very, very strong. And I am so thankful for our district staff, um, Ms. Young, Ms. Talley, and others who are pushing the envelope when it comes to soccer and looking um, for partnerships and having conversations so that we can extend soccer opportunities to our underserved communities. So that it's not just a few schools that are doing well, but that we have robust opportunities in this sport for um, all of our students. I want to say um, congratulations to Hendricks Avenue Elementary Coach Shannon McGlenn, First Coast News Teacher of the Week. I want to highlight some community building activities that are happening in our schools. Um, Principal Reese at Inglewood Elementary had a math game night where parents and students came and then they could take games and board games home to do math activities at home. To Principal White at Hogan Spring Glen, for a primary growth parade where their pre-K through second grade students paraded through the third through fifth grade students who were cheering them on for the growth that they had had so far in the year. For Principal Brown at Southside Estates Elementary for their Black History Museum program. For Principal Peterson at Holiday Hill for a Soulmates Walking Club where they get together, they put on their Holiday Hill shirts, Soulmates, S-O-L-E. And, um, and walk through the community so that they are visible in the community. So it's physical exercise and marketing all together. What could be better? Um, and then also for Wolfson for their celebration of black excellence, which is the first year program that students developed. Um, first year club, a black history club, put together this program. And the program was great. But what was also exciting about it is that they, they presented once to their students, and then the second time they presented to elementary students that they had invited. And when I asked for highlights, two of the elementary principals listed going to the program as one of their highlights, as one of the brags, that they were invited by high school to come and the program was excellent and the students were so pumped to be there. And I, I love that community building um, and high school to elementary connection. Moving into some pretty cool partnering opportunities that we have. Uh, Principal Peterson at Holiday Hill Elementary is um, working with UNF College of Education and Human Services. They have five teachers participating in a grant program to expand, to expand STEM experiences in the pre-K to second grade classrooms. Um, I want to say thank you to Jackie Cornelius with the Douglas Anderson Foundation um, for their participation and involvement with Extravaganza, which was an excellent uh, program and saying thank you to um, and, and congratulations to Principal Wilson and all of the arts area 
um, chairs and the students for just the high quality program that they put on at um, the Times Union Center. To A.D. Talley um, for Media Day. Um, so we had our spring sports athletes and, and my son got to represent um, baseball from his school to go to a media day that was put on by High School 912, YMCA, and Baker Sports and got practice speaking to um, people putting a microphone in their face and asking them questions, which is a really good experience and maybe a little frightening um, for high school students and their coaches. Um, also, um, to Principal Emmanuel Wright at Lovegrove Elementary for partnering with Vision is Priceless to um, do no-cost eye exams for students. I want to say thank you to JPEF for inviting me to the Legislative Issues Forum and, and letting me talk about that and for being engaged and creating a forum for citizens to partner with us and be engaged on items of legislation. Um, I want to say thank you and highlight a partnership opportunity with um, Ms. Schultz and Ms. Taylor to put on the DCPF, DCPS Health Fair for staff on March 11th at Sandalwood High School. They have a list of vendors and partners who are going to be there and, and what a wonderful opportunity to promote health and wellness with our staff. And lastly, I want to thank Dr. Green and highlight the partnership um, that she has with us in doing the Chat with the Soup programs mm -hmm. and announced that on April... She loves those. Those are her favorite. <laughs> <laughs> on April 14th, um, I'm going to partner with board members Coker and Anderson at Sandalwood High School for a Chat with the Soup because um, we share students who all go... To Sandalwood. It's such a huge school. Huge. Probably half of Jacksonville <laughs> could go to. But anyway, um, we all share students who go. So we're going to do that. And then on April 28th at Inglewood Elementary, we're going to have um, uh, a chat with the soup. And thank you, multiple thank yous to our ESL department who will be providing translators so that parents um, who speak other languages can participate in a chat with the soup. And, um, and, and truly be engaged with their student experience in their student schools. So I want to thank, um, thank them for making that possible. Is that it? That is it. Okay. I thought you were about to flip the page. I, I did not write on the back. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you for those updates. Like that. That's amazing. All that great information. Board Member Hershey. So I would like to recognize and congratulate, and I'm sure we'll do it again in April, but just wanted to congratulate uh, Board Member Jones, who will be recognized um, by One Jax uh, for a humanitarian award, and I know that's coming up in April, so we are proud of you and appreciate your leadership, not only to this board, but to our city over the years. We are blessed to have you on the board and it's an honor to work with you and and i just wanted to to acknowledge that uh, recognition that, that's forthcoming in april for you um, this is national reading month and tomorrow morning bright and early i will be at river city science academy in mandarin which means i have to get up early because as uh, <laughs> there because the traffic. of traffic, traffic. Uh, to get there and park um, but I'm looking forward to reading my Dr. Seuss book um, that, that they've assigned to me to read tomorrow morning. And also, um, this week is the um, Construction Career Days that takes place out at the Equestrian Center. And I'm looking forward to participating in that uh, tomorrow after I leave River City Science Academy. I also wanted to just mention that we are in the middle of the legislative session and there are a plethora of bills that impact education and i'm certain that there are bills that many people are following and keeping an eye on uh, mr jones and i both got a call from a student uh, over the weekend i think mr jones spoke to him on sunday and i spoke to him on monday um, and while he shares some of the concerns he had about some uh, legislation moving through Tallahassee, I also encouraged him um, to reach out to uh, our local senators, our, st our state senators, uh, Senator Bean, as well as Senator Gibson, uh, to let them know 
um, the, the student perspective of some of this legislation. And I even uh, texted him their contact information uh, to, to ensure that he could help others get in, in um, contact. And I think, and I share that because I think we talk a lot about student voice and we have students come and speak to us, but reminding them to engage and reach out to state leaders now is also a good exercise as well. I just wanted to mention uh, one of the many bills that I'm keeping an eye on that I think will have a direct, uh, many will have a direct impact on, on us locally, but the, the bill that's moving through now and being looked at that creates a seven member panel to approve charter schools for the entire state of Florida. And so what that does is that usurps the ability of local boards to deny a charter. And so that just means that the state level, they can approve a charter school for Duval County without any of our input and then we oversee it. Uh, and they, this has been something that has been uh, building since I've been on the board. It's gotten more traction this year and it is uh, in, this, in the House, I mean in the Senate this week. So if you have a bill that is important to you, I encourage you to, uh, to reach out to our two state senators, Senator Gibson as well as Senator Bean. And on that note, I would say enjoy spring break, but everybody stay healthy so we can wrap up the school year. And I am actually looking forward to graduation uh, inside this year. <laughs> so <laughs> let's stay well so we can pull that off. Thank you, Board Member Hershey. I have just a, a few, few comments. Uh, number one, uh, just uh, we talked about Coach Day in my, my report, but there's so many memories. I mean, even me just going to the uh, Bob Hayes and seeing him riding around in that golf cart um, and making sure everybody was good. He always made sure, you good, you good? And I, I just love that about him. And I know that he's in a good place. He's, he's resting peacefully and in power. Uh, so just uh, to his family and, and everybody who loved him, we just are, your, our condolences to you. Um, also wanted to, of course, acknowledge Women's History Month as a father of three daughters. Like we're definitely going to be uh, talking about that um, in our in our home, but also want to recognize the amazing women that we have on this board. I appreciate each of one of you, as well as our amazing superintendent and staff. Um, because of you, we are. I always say, um, two shout outs to Reigns and Reball. Um, number one, we won the baseball classic, probably because I threw out the first pitch. I don't know if you all it's probably not recorded on video. <laughs> Um, but it was a perfect strike, and it was 90 miles an hour. I think they clocked it. Um, in addition to that, I want to uh, thank both the principals of Rains and Reef not just for that and the, the jumbo shrimp, but also there was another event that happened at uh, Rains and Reef which was the Leadership Florida actually came into town, um, education leaders from all over the state, um, and they came and visited both Rains and Reef um, and thoroughly enjoyed their time. They got to hear from the superintendent as well. And I just really appreciate the principals, both uh, Dr. Bostic and Dr. Hall, for all of their leadership. And they really do um, embody us as a, as a county. And I really appreciated that. And nothing but rave reviews from the folks who visited there. Also, a quick shout out um, to Gilbert uh, Middle School. They were featured on the news for a Black History Carousel, where they brought in so many different leaders from around the community to sort of interact with their students. In addition to that, they did an amazing Black History program that I got to be a part of really just putting black excellence on display. So uh, thank you to Principal Parker, who is a newer principal over there, but really already making waves in that community. Highlands as well, um, amazing work happening over there. I got to attend an attendance, a perfect attendance party. I was handing out, I was in charge of the, the sausage pizza, which people didn't like as much, but, but we were good. So I was handing out pizza to the, all the folks who got perfect attendance for the amount of time. And it was just a great celebration, the students, um, were felt good about showing up to school every day, and that's what we need them to do to be able to learn. Uh, last couple of things, um, I want I wanted to, to, we'll probably say it again, but Board Member Jones and this award you're going to get, um, every time I go into City Hall and I see your picture on the wall, I just, number one, I laugh, but then I just think about <laughs> all, because I was like, somebody's going to have a picture like it's that of me later on. Years ago. Right. <laughs> but I just think about all the, everything that you have seen um, and that you're able to embark upon us as a board in this community and I'm just I'm just honored every time I think about it, I'm like whoa I'm serving with history so I just really will talk say it again but we just I just want to know I'm, I'm just honored to serve with you um, and I'm gonna end there and say once again have a wonderful spring break everyone thank you to this amazing staff who helps put all this together 
our two board staff over there. Chat for the soup. Oh, yeah. We are also going to have a chat with the soup, because why not? Um, and it'll be after spring break. <laughs> and, and the folks will know about it. But, you know, why not? Um, we, we, ha we love a chat with the soup. But we'll chat, too. We'll, we'll also chat with you. But thank you so much for everyone. I will, seeing no comments or further, we'll move to adjourn. Second. Move my board member Pearson, second by board member Anderson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Ayes have it. Any nays? All right. We are adjourned. Thank you.